Please welcome to the stage Conrad N. Hilton Foundation, Hilton Humanitarian Prize Senior Director, Maggie Miller. Good morning, we're here. Um, welcome to the 2022 Hilton Humanitarian Prize Symposium. My name is Maggie Miller and I am Senior Director of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize at the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. We have put together the programming for today with help from more colleagues than I can list right now, all of whom I would like to thank, along with our board, for making today possible. I do have to thank three people, Hannah Mora, Saiba Ulrich, and Brianne Bill, who have been working around the clock to get us all here today. So today's theme is the power of perseverance. And you will hear more about how we landed on this theme and where we plan to take it in just a few minutes. But first, I do have a few housekeeping notes and an important introduction to make. Please silence your cell phones uh, during the symposium, but please do use them <laughs> to engage in the conversation online. The hashtag for the day is Hilton Prize. For those of you in this room, Wi-Fi information can be found on the screens. Um, and on the back page of your programs. Last but not least, uh, on your table, you will find a survey about today's event. We read every single one. So please fill out the survey as the day proceeds. Uh, and thank you. So now that logistics are out of the way, let's get started. The Hilton Humanitarian Prize is presented each year to an organization, nonprofit organization, both to focus attention on the great need for humanitarian aid worldwide and to shine a light on those organizations providing solutions for impacted communities across the globe. It's no secret that the last few years have been tough, to put it mildly. And yet, during these tumultuous times, we have indeed also seen the power of perseverance. In our hospitals and schools, certainly, but also in all of the ongoing crises that existed before the pandemic ever began. Those crises never disappeared. Many of the people in this room today, in fact, and those joining us online, have been working tirelessly to improve the lives of individuals impacted by some of the world's biggest and most complex crises. I think we will see from our speakers today that we can hold both realities. On the one hand, the inexcusable humanitarian crises and suffering, and also the perseverance, creativity, and also the paths forward individuals and communities are creating when they find themselves stuck in the crossfire of climate change, a global pandemic, political upheaval, and protracted humanitarian crises around the globe. I think, and I hope, that you will leave here today both having borne witness to the darkest sides of humanity, but also having seen the most beautiful and productive sides of humanity. Our former board chair and a current Hilton Prize juror, Steve Hilton, who happens to be a surfer, told us during his retirement speech to always look for the light. From what I hear, that's what you do as a surfer in the tunnel of a wave. It's how you get through it, but it's also what we do when facing overwhelming challenges. We look for the light of what is possible when we persevere together. So now it is my turn to introduce Peter Lahorn, President and CEO of the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. You will hear from Peter about the purpose and the focus of the Foundation's work and how that relates to this entire event today. I had the opportunity to travel with Peter back in 2019 to several refugee camps in Greece, and I will never forget the time he began speaking to a young man in Arabic. I watched the young man's eyes brighten and his entire energy change as he spoke with Peter in his own language about himself, his background, and his perseverance through extraordinarily difficult circumstances. Not every CEO can do that. So without further ado, please help me welcome to the stage President and CEO of the Conrad and Hilton Foundation, Peter Lahorn.
Thank you, Maggie. I want to salute the energy, the accomplishment, and the purpose in this room and among the people who are working online. You are an inspiring group with all the contributions you've made in your careers. But I can, I can guarantee you that you will leave this room with more inspiration at the end of the day because I think we have a wonderful program for you. Welcome to the 2022 Conrad and Hilton Humanitarian Symposium and welcome to Los Angeles. The Hilton Foundation is, is proud to be hosting you for the first time in person in three years. Um, so for our Norwegian laureate and their compatriots, Kumorn, Guetermida. For those tuning in from Syria, from Jordan, and from Lebanon, marhaba bikum, min salimu fuad, sabah al-khair enna, masa al-khair enkum. For our Somali listeners, sabah wanagsan, yo galab wanagsan. And for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters who are away from your homes, either inside Ukraine or outside, dobro ranku, ta dobro dinya. And that's only four of the, lang of the dozens of languages that today's Noria works in around the world. The purpose of the Conrad and Hilton Founda uh, Foundation is very simple, to improve the human condition. Conrad Hilton, our founder, the founder of Hilton Hotels, established the foundation in 1944 with the purpose of using his resources to improve the human condition and to ensure that no one wandered in darkness in their dark, uh, no one wandered alone in their darkest hour. The Hilton Foundation's first grant in 1945 was for $100. And today, the foundation has over 150 employees and will give away more than $430 million this year to organizations committed to finding the solutions that Maggie spoke of moments ago. Conrad said in his last will and testament that the peoples of the world deserve to be loved and encouraged never to be abandoned, to wander alone in poverty and darkness. And that is our resolve at the Conrad and Hilton Foundation, to ensure that we are working with partners committed to exactly this. You will be learning more about the 2022 Hilton Humanitarian Prize recipient, the Norwegian Refugee Council, or NRC, later today. Their work epitomizes this resolve to love, to encourage, and never abandon anyone, even in the most dire of crises. For NRC, there are no forgotten crises. As Maggie said, the theme of today's gathering is the power of perseverance, and I think you will see this in every single one of our speakers today, whether that be through lived experience in a crisis or through leading one of the largest NGOs in the world with tangible models that can and have been emulated the world over, or through the work of Lindsay Adario, photojournalist and Pulitzer Prize winner in bearing witness to those who have faced the deepest crises. Lindsay's work also epitomizes the resolve to walk alongside those in their darkest hour. Today's program will highlight a diversity of experiences and manifest how solutions for today and tomorrow require nuanced conversations about complex topics if we are to persevere together. We hope today that thought leaders from various sectors will connect and identify uh, ways to work together to pave the way to a more inclusive, just, and secure future for all. Once again, we have a distinguished lineup of speakers who will lead us, I know, through thought-provoking discussions on the topic of perseverance. And today, in, in today's divisive environment, in case you have noticed, uh, we, we have asked our speakers to speak at a vantage point above partisan divisiveness, to rise above politics in support of having difficult, candid, but constructive conversations about how to move our world forward. So later today, we will honor the Norwegian Refugee Council, an organization dedicated to preserving the rights of the displaced and refugees uh, during crisis and doing so on a massive scale. It's my hope that by honoring the Norwegian Refugee Council, this afternoon we can share with the international community the inspiring accomplishments of this extraordinary organization and also apply to our own work and our own communities some of the approaches they have modeled for us so well. And now it's my great honor to introduce our master of ceremonies today, Soledad O'Brien. Soledad is an award-winning documentarian, journalist, speaker, author, and philanthropist 
who founded Soledad O'Brien Productions, a multi-platform media production community uh, company dedicated to telling empowering and authentic stories on a range of social issues. She's just launched one on Rosa Parks, streaming on Peacock, and we highly, highly recommend it. With her husband, Soledad is the founder of the Powerful Foundation, which helps young women get through college. Soledad is going to lead us through the day with her wisdom. She will also be sitting down to speak with last year's uh, laureate, uh, Camfed, about girl schooling. And with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage Ms. Soledad O'Brien. Peter, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I am very happy to be here. The number and severity of humanitarian crises are growing globally. Today, we face record force displacement around the world. We are seeing growing inequality, catastrophic national, natural disasters exacerbated by climate change, and of course, the fallout from a once in a generation global pandemic. And if this pandemic has shown us anything, it's that humanitarian crisis knows no border. It affects all of us. We have to find ways to build our future together to ensure the humanitarian system reflects the challenges of today and truly serves those who need it the most. And that's why a moment like this, where we can bring together inspirational leaders working directly on these issues is so important. The Hilton Humanitarian Prize was started in 1996 as a tribute to Conrad and Hilton's lifetime of international humanitarian efforts and is presented to a nonprofit organization judged to have made exemplary and extraordinary contributions toward alleviating human suffering. At $2.5 million, the Hilton Humanitarian Prize is the world's largest annual humanitarian award. Today, we're going to hear directly from the 2022 Humanitarian Prize recipient, Norwegian Refugee Council, an organization founded just two years after that of the Hilton Foundation. NRC was founded in 1946 to protect the rights of people who are displaced by violence and find themselves in extreme vulnerability during crisis. NRC assists civilians in armed conflict prioritizing neglected and hard to reach areas where access to assistance is limited and increasingly supports people displaced by natural disasters, the adverse effects of climate change and other forms of violence. Today, 76 years after its foundation, NRC's work is as imperative as it has ever been. NRC now operates in more than 35 countries around the world facing both new and protracted humanitarian crises. We will now be turning our attention to the life of an individual and an idea. The individual is Sir Fazli Hassan Abed, founder of 2008 Hilton Prize laureate BRAC, who Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times called one of the unsung heroes of modern times, and the idea being that hope can overcome poverty. Sir Fazle passed away in 2019 at the age of 83, but before his death, he thankfully agreed to have Scott McMillan, Director of Learning and Innovation at BRAC USA and Abed's speechwriter, share the lessons both of his life and those learned from the creation and scaling of BRAC into an organization that has reached more than 100 million people in Asia and Africa. Abed's son, Shamaran Abed, Executive Director of BRAC International, will be interviewed by the esteemed Zeynab Saudi, who you all know is not only a current Hilton Humanitarian Prize juror, but also founder of 2006 Prize Laureate Women for Women International. In addition to being a TV host, author, and now co-founder of Daughters for Earth, a $100 million fund aimed to mobilize women to actively engage in climate change solutions by leading efforts for land preservation. Before their discussion, we're gonna watch a short clip and then hear a reading from Hope Over Fate, The Science of Ending Global Poverty by the author, Scott McMillan. Take a look.
He's been called one of the unsung heroes of modern times. Fazle Hassan Abed was more than just a mild-mannered accountant. As a young man in the early 1970s, he had a corporate multinational job in finance. He could have stayed on that career path and led a very comfortable life. Instead, in 1972, confronted with war and natural disaster in his homeland, he quit his job and founded BRAC, originally the Bangladesh Rehabilitation Assistance Committee. People died because they were poor. And I thought that the kind of life I was leading at the time working for Shell Oil, I thought that this life is not uh, really something that I'd like to pursue. I'd like to pursue something else. In the decades to come, BRAC would become massive, reaching 100 million people in Asia and Africa. It is known as one of the world's most effective anti-poverty efforts. Abed avoided the limelight. He preferred to let his work speak for itself. Microfinance, community healthcare, education, humanitarian aid, and more. What links these diverse programs together is Abed's lifelong conviction that hope itself can help people overcome poverty. He saw that poverty was not just a lack of money or skills. People remained trapped in poverty, in part because they thought things could never change. They thought it was their fate to be poor. So Abed started by changing this mindset. He gathered people in small groups to talk about their problems so that together they could confront the injustices that held them back. They began to understand that a better world was possible and that they themselves had the power to build it. This is the power of hope. Millions of people planning for the future, saving and investing, girls filling up classrooms, women starting their own businesses. BRAC is known for its entrepreneurial approach to tackling poverty. It is known for being efficient and effective, but it is far more than that. The legacy of Safazli Hassan Abed is the triumph of hope over fate. Human life is for a short period in, in, on Earth, and I would like that short period that each of us have to be as happy and as productive and as meaningful as possible. The year is 1974, the location, a remote part of northern Bangladesh, and a young accountant named Fazli Abed, with no prior experience in relief or aid, has spent the last couple of years working with the people here. The poverty is grinding, and he's already experienced many setbacks. But he's recently begun experimenting with a new way of teaching people basic skills like reading and writing. This new technique relies on dialogue and discussion, and it's based on the methods of a Brazilian educator named Paulo Freire. It starts by gathering people in an open space in the village in front of a poster, a single sheet of paper based on one word, home, bari, B-A-R-I in the Bangla language. So picture it here. The word is written, but because the people can't read or write, there's also a simple drawing of a house. Why is the home important? The teacher would ask, pointing to the image. The villagers point out that the word signifies more than just a dwelling. It includes children, spouses, livestock, the, the patch of land surrounding the hut. And as the discussion, discussion gets underway, the classes get quite animated. Some people's homes are bigger than others, one, one person might say. Or, during stormy nights, it rains right through my thatched roof, and I can't afford to fix it, another might say. So, next day, another word. This time, tiger. Now, every Bengali knows what a tiger is and what it represents. Fierceness, wildness, the untamed state of nature. The teacher, now acting more like a facilitator, asks the villagers. 
Can a tiger build a house? Of course not, the people in the group say. A tiger can't build a house. If it rains, he just runs under a tree. Can you build a house? The teacher asks. Of course, the villagers reply, and they start to discuss it. If we have access to the tools and materials, we can all build homes for ourselves. And then the teacher says this. Human beings are therefore different from the tiger because we can adapt, our, uh, adapt nature to suit our needs, whereas the tiger can only adapt himself to nature. We do not wander from place to place in search of food, but we choose to plant seeds and till the soil so we can stay put. That is our choice. This process of changing nature to suit the needs of human beings through their own creative activities is called the process of civilization. And it is humans alone who engage in it. The tiger cannot plan ahead he cannot build a boat to go from one village to the next when the floods come. In the words of Paolo Freire, the tiger exists in an overwhelming present with no history, no development, no concept of today or tomorrow. A hundred tigers cooperating together still could not build a house. Men and women acting together can do many things. So can each of you discuss what creative activities you've done today? the teacher asks. One person might have planted seeds or harvested rice. Another might have finally repaired the thatch on his leaky roof. Perhaps someone worked on a flood wall to direct the flow of water so it would irrigate the fields properly. The point starts to become clear. They had already contributed to the building of a civilized life. Society was theirs to own and to shape, not something given to them. Acting collectively, they could do so much more. Poverty had been made by humans. It could be unmade by them, too. This was the most basic lesson for human consciousness. The effect on the villagers was remarkable. They began to question their situation, imagine a better future, and think constructively about how to bring it about. The road ahead would be long, very long. It would not be enough just to be hopeful or to encourage critical thinking. Access to essential services like credit, livelihood training, health care, a decent education for the children, all these things so long denied them, all of these things would still be needed. But none of this would mean a thing if the people did not first believe in the possibility of change. The first sparks of self-worth had begun to flicker. Once lit, those flames would be very hard to extinguish. I remember the day Abed told me that story for the first time, and I remember thinking, wow, somebody ought to write a book about that. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Zainab Salbi, and I am here. I have the privilege of being in conversation with uh, Shamran Abid, who happens to be the son of Sir uh, Fazal Hassan Abid, and as well as the executive director of BRAC International. But before I start the conversation, I can't recommend this book high enough. And I'm not, no one paid me for that promotional <laughs> section in here. But I gotta tell you, we are from the development sector. We, our readings are either heavy development work or silly romantic novels, so we can like just, like just chill or Netflix episodes or whatever. This combines it all. And I read it in one day. And it's because it combined the romance with the development work. And it combined, and for all of us who are dedicated in this sector, who work in this sector, will resonate with it in between our personal lives, our ideological lives, and our professional lives. And so it's a brilliant, truly brilliant read that I uh, finished in one day, and it's a sign of a great book. So thank you, uh, Scott, for, for that book. And I am so excited to be in conversation with you, Sharmar, and I want to start with your father, who I had the privilege of knowing him, of serving with him on the Conrad Hilton Jury Award. 
um, uh, or jury. And yet I honestly, reading this book, I was like, oh, I so wish I knew these things about him. You know, from, you know, things we don't talk about, right, in our networking gatherings. You know, we talk about our latest work. We, especially your father, everyone admired him. We never took the time to talk about the personal, the ideological, the, uh, the things that impacted him uh, in who he is, as a, uh, who he was as a man. So let me start with how was it being a child growing up in the household to a father who, by modern words, was a workaholic um, or extremely passionate mm -hmm. about his work. He didn't see the separation between his work and his life. It was all very integrated. The family and the, and the, and the job was uh, always an integrated part of his life. Your parents lived above the apartment, uh, uh, in an apartment above Brack office for the first you know, decade or so of Brack. So how was it growing up with a, chi a child of a, of a father like that? And I'm asking on the person because all, all of us have families and some parents, sometimes our families resent us for working a lot in the field <laughs> or having issues and we're always you know, trying to consolidate uh, these two aspects of our lives. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, and I also, before I start, wanted to add my congratulations to all colleagues at the NRC. Um, uh, it's, um, it's hard to talk about that because, you know, obviously growing up, you know, you experience it in one way and then when you look back and you think about it growing up, it sometimes <laughs> might be a little bit different. But actually, you know, growing up, um, Obviously, you know, and I should say that I, there's only one father I ever, ever grew up with, so it's the only one I don't have a comparator, so I don't know what it would have been to grow up with any other father. But, you know, honestly speaking, and you knew him, Zenab, I mean, he was quite an unassuming person. Very. And um, growing up, we had a sense that he was doing very important work, um, but it was quite normal as it, our, our childhoods. Um, and I think for us, you know, one thing we had with our father was even though he was a workaholic and he was out in the field a lot and he was traveling a lot as well, one of the things he was very good at was being in the present and in the moment when he had time for us. So whenever he was back home from work and we were there, he was very, he was there. On the weekends he was there. When, when he wasn't traveling and he was at home, he had a lot of time for us. Mm -hmm. Um, and that made a big difference, and it meant a lot to us that when we had our father, we had him fully. And that's something, honestly speaking, I struggle with now all the time, um, you know, to be there when I'm at home. And I was actually talking to Scott earlier in the week, and we were talking about, you know, he was saying, how do you deal with this, traveling all the children. time with two young children? And, you know, how does your wife deal with you being away so much? And I, I, was, I was saying, you know, she doesn't begrudge the traveling as much as when I'm in the house and I'm on my phone or emailing or I'm on WhatsApp and she's saying, can you put that down and talk to your, to your kids? Mm -hmm. um, so, but for my father, I mean, I, and I guess this was before the, the age of email and WhatsApp, but he was very much there for us and that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. But honestly, and the other thing is, we, I had a very, I had a, big age difference with my father. We had 45 years between us. Um, so he was already quite uh, established. Brack was already quite uh, big by the time I knew what was going on. Um, so I think for me, at least growing up, I had a sense that he was doing something very, very important. So even though I had to share him with the work, and as we discussed yesterday, Brack was like the eldest sibling uh, in our family. That was first priority for him always. Uh, but honestly, it, it, you know, we felt proud of that. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't feel, even now thinking back, that there was ever a point where I felt um, that mm -hmm. I was being shortchanged somehow. Yeah, beautiful, right. beautiful. Now, you end up being the executive director of BRAC International. Mm -hmm. um, there are two BRACs, BRACs uh, Bangladesh and mm -hmm. BRAC International. There's uh, many aspects of BRAC, which we will talk about that. Mm -hmm. But how did you come to decide that you're going to follow your father's footstep in the development sector. And again, you know, your father gave up um, 
a privileged life. Uh, he was an accountant as uh, he was actually the head of Shell's accounting department in, mm -hmm. in East Pakistan and went from that to, as I said, an apartment above Bracken. That was the condition of marrying your mother. That mm -hmm. it's going to be a simple, humble life. So, you know, children of that, you know, we always consile with that. Like, either you become like, a, let's me go to the corporate world and make as much money as possible, or you chose to follow his footsteps. Um, tell me the journey that made you decide that. Yeah, it's a very nonlinear journey, actually. So I, you know, when I was growing up, at different points, I had different interests. You know, at one point when I was a child, I, I'm, I really liked planes and aviation, so I thought I'd be, I'd want to be a pilot. Um, and then at different times, you know, at, at different points in your life, I think children always also aspire to be like their parents. So there were times when I thought, yeah, I should grow up and do what my father does. Um, but um, when I was in my teenage years, um, and I'd left home to go to boarding school, um, I started becoming quite interested in politics. Um, and I was even coming at it from the work that my father was doing I thought, you know, these civil society organizations, these NGOs do, do tremendous work, but wouldn't it be great if the government got its act together? And, uh, you know, in countries like ours, you know, if, if we could do, I mean, even if government worked, then life would be so much better for so many more people and the NGOs can only do so much. So I thought I should, I would want, I might want to do that. And um, when I said to my father, I'm thinking of maybe going into politics at some point. Uh, he said to me, if you're really serious about that, get yourself a self-employed career, right? Uh, because that's, you know, pol politicians need to be able to go back and forth and, and, you know, have a career that you can go back to. Um, so maybe you should think about that. And I thought, okay, what's the, what's the one that would interest me? And it was law, actually. So I thought I might be a lawyer. And then, as you, mo as you know, most, you know mo most politicians come from that. Many politicians come from that, from that career point. So anyway, so I studied law. I went back to Bangladesh. I didn't practice for very long. It was a very short practice. And then I got into journalism. Um, and that was an interest as well, because I liked writing about politics. And uh, you know, I had some friends in the you know, who were journalists, and they said, why don't you come and try this out for a while? Um, so I did that for a few years. Um, and then finally found my way into Bragg. But it was never sort of expected of us. My father never put any expectations. As a matter of fact, he always encouraged us to do what we wanted to do, both my sister and I. Yeah. Uh, and so when I went in, it was sort of, yeah, at that point an opportunity came up and I was interested in it and uh, it seemed like the right thing to do. So, Beautiful. yeah. So let's go to politics because mm. politics was a pivotal moment in your father's life, mm. the independence of Bangladesh, yeah. uh, which was a horrible war. Uh, and uh, created massive number of rape and it mm. was a genocidal uh, war yeah. in many ways um, and that's what changed everything about him but I want to and he started with working with displaced people and refugees yeah. uh, as a result of the Bangladeshi war um, but his uh, ideology on mm. how do you deal with poverty mm. was very particular mm. and it came from um, thinkers uh, and thought makers from the developing world. It mm. did not come from studying at Oxford or Harvard or mm. any of the um, first world, if you may, or developed world thinkers. It came from Brazilian uh, yep. thought makers. Tell me more about that, because this for me is what I found so interesting reading the book, mm. is that we really do not talk about the ideological impact that we have in doing our work. Yeah. Your father has a very particular one. It wasn't only him personally. He actually asked Brack staff, at least at the early states of uh, Brack's years, to mm. read um, and study and, and educate themselves about that theory on, uh, on poverty. So can you tell us more about that? Yeah, thank you. I, you know, there's a, also a story that this book by the Brazilian educator philosopher, it's called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And there's a story, it's not real, it's a myth at Bragg that he made my mom read it on their wedding night. <laughs> um, because it was so important to him, that this idea uh, that was in the book. But the idea, so, yeah, so t t just to say that you know, he had that corporate career before the war, and then the war happened. Right before the war, there was a cyclone, which was one of the, the biggest um, tropical cyclones ever recorded. 
um, killed about 300,000 people in Bangladesh in 1970. That was a big impact on his life. And then the war broke out a couple of months after that. And another you know, million or so people died during that war in 1971. And my father then decided he's not going back to his corporate career after that because that didn't seem um, you know, worthwhile anymore to him given what had just happened to the country. And so he started out on this development path, but it was really for him, and I think it's, it's definitely in the book, um, you know, it was supposed to be for a couple of years. He wanted to go in, he wanted to do some stuff, he wanted to build homes and shelter for refugees returning from India to Bangladesh, do that for a couple of years, and then go, probably go back to a corporate life of some kind. But as he started working on these issues of development, he realized that you don't, this is not a two-year thing. You've got to work with people and the issues and the challenges evolve over time. And one of the things that he really understood, with, along with his colleagues at BRAC, really understood early was this idea, and this is the idea that came partly from Paulo Freire, but partly from the work they were doing and what they were learning working with very poor people is the idea that if you wanted to make sustainable change, if you wanted to transform people's lives, you, could, you would have to move them from being passive recipients of aid to being active participants in their own development. That was the big idea, right? The agency uh, of the person. The agency poor. of the person. You can't, you can't look at this person as a recipient of aid. Aid is, I mean, development of, is something that is not given uh, from, by someone to another person. It is actually taken. It is how do you build the confidence, the self-awareness, the self, you know, um, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's that idea of hope, but it's more than just hope. Um, it is so important for poor people, mm. right? And for too long, the entire development was about how do we give them things, how do we allow them, how do we, you know, help them to survive, but never actually move out of that state of, of existence, which is almost dehumanizing. Um, and we can talk more about that when we talk about some of our work. But, you know, so that was the early idea. And that actually, as, as you said, it didn't come from sort of northern learning. It came from southern experience and the experience of people working in the global south with very poor people and trying to understand what do you need to do to sustainably pull people out of such dehumanizing poverty. And in so many ways, it truly, I mean, the things that he has done at BRAC, he was ahead of his uh, game almost, ahead of the, his time, mm -hmm. because right now we are talking about intersectionality of different discipline and different yeah. sectors and how they we have to address multi-level of issues we are now talking about the need to invest in organizations that are in the global south and mm -hmm. that's that's the future I mean, we're talking about a lot of the issues that he was ahead of his uh, time and sort of with, but did it with confidence mm -hmm. so let me ex uh, explain what i'm getting at, you know, so BRAC, we've heard, is not only known as one of the most effective NGOs in the world, but it's also the largest NGO in the world, employing 100,000 people, uh, impacting 100 million uh, people. And there are so many issues in, that I want to take uh, three moments in here. Mm. Size, let's start with size, yeah. right? Um, I have to say, at the jury, we're always discussing the size, right? Mm. I have to say, generally, in the development sector, whether from outside of it, whether inside of it, we're always discussing the size of our operation. Mm. Should we stay small and stay intact to our mission and the mm. soul of the mission? Should we go big and impact massive number of people? And what's the impact of that? And this is not only our decisions, it's donors impacting that decision, mm. um, funder, you know, diff boards impact that decision. Your father was very clear, size matters mm. and big matters. Mm. He was like, he was not ambivalent about that. Yeah. And there are lots of stories over and over and over. He starts something and someone's like, okay, we just impacted 6,000 students. He's like, okay, now take it to 100,000 students. Mm and constantly challenging 
the staff even, you know, the colleagues yeah. about like, what are you talking about moving from 6,000 to 100? Mm. Can you talk more about that? Because it's, a, it's, it's always an uncomfortable issue for all of us in this sector. How do we manage this, this size matter? Yeah. And how did he keep, and BRAC mm. team kept, the soul of the organization and its ideology that you mm. just talked about as it grew larger? Yeah, I think that was one of the most important things for him, um, impact at scale. Mm. Um, you know, and you can have impact in a small area, in a village or a community, uh, but if you don't build programs for scale and if you can't take it everywhere, then that, at least for him, as far as BRAC was concerned, was not worth doing. Um, one of the most often repeated or often at attributed um, quote, quotes that's attributed to him is this one. Uh, small is beautiful, but big is necessary, right? And he always felt, and you know, coming from Bangladesh, you know, it's a small country geographically, but it's a very high population. I mean, right now we're 170 million people, which is half the size of the US uh, in a country that's the size of the state of New York, roughly, um, you know, if you want to solve problems, and you know, obviously 1972, we were about half that size population-wise. We've doubled uh, since our liberation. But the idea, you know, his thing was, I can't solve problems for 5,000 people or one village or one community. I need to solve problems, whether it's infant mortality, maternal mor mortality, or you know, literacy, wh whatever it is, access to women's access to credit, you know, women's access to financial services. I need to be able to solve it for the entire country. And so he was completely unapologetic about his relentless pursuit for scale. And um, I'll tell you a personal story. Um, so he, um, so w when he was quite unwell, mm. and his, he actually, he was actually at the at the Hilton Jury I was meeting with him. Um, in June of 2019 in London and he'd passed away by December 2019. So he, his illness was quite short and drastic because he was diagnosed with glioblastoma, which is a very aggressive form of uh, brain cancer. And if you decide not to treat it, um, it's quite quick. But as he was sort of, as the decline was starting, I mean, he would sort of gather us and talk to us about things because it was his last opportunities to get, sort of get things through to us. And one of the last things that I really remember very vividly him telling us, those of us who are sort of in Brax leadership and management, he said, you know, my entire life, everybody was always trying to slow me down and tell me that I needed to think smaller, right? He said, my board was trying to do that to me. My colleagues were trying to do that to me. The donors were trying to do that to me, right? And I was always so clear that I just wanted to grow. And I always thought, if I can't grow and reach more people, then there are people out there who are not going to get these services. And I can't be sitting there, you know, being discouraged by my board and my colleagues and my donors. I need to push them harder than they're willing to go. Um, so yeah, that's, that was to him, and that was one of the last things he said is, guys, don't let people talk you out of doing big, bold things, right? Um, have the courage to go faster and harder than the people around you are willing to go and just push them. Uh, because there's so much need out there. Yesterday we talked about 100 million people in displaced refugees. There's 600 to 700 million people in extreme poverty. Um, we, can't, we can't be small. As I have to say that particularly spoke to my heart, so thank you so much for sharing that particular story, and I will always take it with me. Uh, small is beautiful, but size, but big is necessary. necessary. Beautiful, yeah. um, beautiful. And he was also daring in the same way, and because we have to put the context in here. BRAC was started in the 70s, basically, um, and it grew in the 80s and the 90s. Bangladesh is seen as the, you know, was, was seen for the longest time, uh, time as the basket Plastic case, case uh, of the world, right? So here, here from that country arises this audacious 
daring, inspiring man that changes the world and changes our sector, basically. Um, and the change is not only in the sides, but also in saying, I am going to work in different sector. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work in, yes, started with poverty. We, Scott talked to us about uh, housing, but then went to schooling, alternative mm -hmm. schooling, and then retails, my first visit to Bangladesh. <laughs> Actually, the best store in Bangladesh is Arang, department mm. stores, uh, you know, mm. which has the best quality of um, uh, everything, handicrafts, actually, yeah. handicrafts and everything you can get out of Bangladesh, you know. Um, he, you know, again, while we are many donors and many boards are telling us you have to focus on one sector. If you work on only microcredit, you work only on microcredit. Mm. He's like education, housing, and microcredit. Uh, oh. Retail. I remember him telling me one time, like the future is going to be a shortage of nurse, uh, nurses, so we're going to look into doing school for nurses. Mm. And it, it's, how did he? Because everyone gets scared. It's like, oh my God, the donors get scared. You're doing mm. too much. How did he manage that, or how did Brack manage that? And what are the lessons you can embark upon us about going into or philosophies? You know, what are you learn? What have you learned from that experience of addressing? the intersectionalities in person's life. Hmm. Yeah, again, I think it came from his understanding of, of poverty and why people were in those situations. And again, he was, for him, it was very clear that poverty was complex and it was not single dimensional. It was multidimensional and you had to do, you had to address and tackle all of these different dimensions of poverty. So, he never had, or he never believed in uh, a magic bullet, right? Um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, that this will end poverty or that will end poverty. And, you know, we, sometimes we need these sound bites and things we need to simplify. So, you know, in this country and in the West, there is this concept of an elevator pitch, right? At BRAC, we really struggle to do our elevator pitch mm -hmm. because it is not a simple idea. Poverty is a complex idea, and it requires complex solutions. The programs have to be simple, scalable, but the idea and the, the thinking has to take into account the multifarious sort of aspects of poverty. So for him, it, it was really coming, he, you know, it was not ideological, it was problem solving. You're solving a problem, you've got to look at, you know, lack of education, you've got to look at lack of healthcare, you've got to look at the gender angle, very important for Brack's work. You've got to look at sort of, access to opportunities and services, access to finance and credit, you know, women starting businesses, what do they need? I mean, if you just even look at it from one particular problem. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, in the 1980s, when we start, you know, when BRAC was scaling its microfinance work, you know, a lot of women in, in rural areas would buy, take their loans and then buy cows, right? And then he'd ha he started thinking about, okay, now all of these women in these rural areas of Bangladesh have bought cows, and they're gonna to need to sell their milk. Where do they sell the milk? Um, how do they keep the cow healthy? So how do I train paravets to go and immunize and vaccinate the cow? So Brack trained thousands of paravets. You know, we decided, okay, how do we collect the milk? Who do they sell it to? How do they get a fair price? So Brack started buying the milk from these women all over the country, setting up chilling centers all over the country so the, so the milk could be chilled so that they th then it could be transported overnight into a dairy facility that Brack set up, right, to then pasteurize, pack it, and retail that milk in Bangladesh, in, th in the cities, in Dhaka and Chidong and everywhere else. So the idea, the problem was getting a fair price for these women who were buying cows and had to sell milk, ultimately ended in Brack setting up an entire dairy enterprise, right? So it was all about taking each step of that problem and trying to find the solution and doing it sustainably so that you can then scale it and have millions of people buying cows and producing milk and being Brilliant. able to sell that. Brilliant. I have to say, I, in my 20s, I studied in Bangladesh. I did some research. And whenever you go to a village, you know it's BRAC employees because women wear biking. Mm. They have their own bikes, which is you know, still in most of the, that part of the world, is, uh, including my own country, it's not heard of. And he, no. so he was daring in so many ways, like, oh, let's just change that, you know. Mm. Um, and he's pioneered definitely in his, in his investment in women and knowing that this is uh, the, the future. Another daring mm. moment of, um, 
of uh, Sir Abed, uh, which is going global. Mm. I believe BRAC is the only uh, organization that came from the uh, developing world or the global south into expanding globally into mm. Africa and all of and other parts of Asia. I remember he was the first organization that went to Kosovo right after the war and in different war zones and different conflicts that I also worked in. Tell me, that's, it's un, that was unexpected. Mm. You know, the ones who expanded were coming from the global north. Mm. Were you privy to some of the discussions and some of the challenges uh, and some of the learnings? And I. One of the things that I learned in here is that he was saying that we actually have a more access to understanding, cultural yeah. uh, understanding of dealing with poverty coming from our own poverty. Mm -hmm. Can you expand more about that and the, learning, the, the learnings of that experience? Yeah. Yeah, so the first country BRAC went into outside Bangladesh was Afghanistan. And this was in 2002, right before, right after the fall of the previous Taliban government. And for him actually, he was looking at Afghanistan in 2002, and it reminded him a lot about Bangladesh in 1972, mm. because all of these Afghan refugees were pouring back in. And he was, he said, this looks like what Bangladesh was when all of the Bangladeshi refugees were coming back from India to find a country that doesn't have the, the wherewithal to take them all in and, and support that. So, so he said, we're going into Afghanistan. And as you can imagine, there was a huge amount of backlash. Again, from everybody, colleagues, board, you know, donors. Uh, there was a huge backlash within Bangladesh, the country, uh, mm. within civil society, mm. because there was this idea that, oh, does he think he's done in Bangladesh? I mean, has he solved, ba I mean, you know, have we solved all our problems that he's gonna now go and do something in Afghanistan? Because, you know, and, you know, he talks about this story that, that this conversation he had much later on. You know, in certain parts of the world, especially in the developed parts of the world, going global seems the natural thing to do, mm -hmm. right? Once you're successful here in the US, you would take it everywhere else. Or you're, you're, if you're successful in Europe, you'd go global. You know, organizations that come from countries like ours don't think like that. Mm -hmm. It's not in our psyche. We don't think about going beyond Bangladesh and going into Afghanistan and then Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and then into East Africa and West Africa and growing in you know, so that was very, very different. I mean, it was actually, as you know, as you said, it was, it was again him saying, you know, I have, we have learned things by working with people in Bangladesh. And he had the sense that some of these learnings were universal, right? You could take these learnings and you could apply them in other settings. I mean, you ob obviously have to understand those contexts and contextualize. But the whole approach that Brack had by then, 30 years of, at that point, about 30 years old, the whole approach that BRAC had developed about working with the community, um, you know, using the resources and the agency of the community to develop programs that are, that are um, you know, sustainable, scalable, impactful, um, and then being able to, to grow that across countries. I mean, mm -hmm. he had a real, um, you know, he had a, he had a real conviction that he could wow. do it in other countries as well. And, and it's so a, another went. way of diplomacy yeah. as well, south yeah. to south diplomacy. Yeah. Um, we are running out of time, so I'm gonna quickly ask you my three last questions. So we'll just rapidly go through them. Mm. They're collaborating with, multi, with different sectors, you know, yeah. with corporations, with multinationals, yeah. with governments. It's a challenge NGOs always mm. face. Do we collaborate? Do we not collaborate? Do we mm. take corporate money? Do we not take? He collaborated with every sector mm. in his leadership, mm. under his leadership, and and really accomplished a lot. Can you tell us a little bit? I because I want to really spend some more time in the other questions. Can you tell us a little bit about his attitude about that collaboration and the criticism and how he handled that? Yeah. Again, I, I mean, he was an extremely practical person, and he really believed that. You know, you know, and he wasn't that ideological. He never took that sort of ideological position that, mm -hmm. you know, we are NGOs and hence we must be against the corporate world. I mean, he came from the corporate world, yes. right? He was sure. trained by the corporate world. Um, so he was very willing to collaborate mm -hmm. with corporates, with multilaterals, with, you know, um, with everyone. The other thing quickly on this one is also in the way that he looked at government. Mm -hmm. I mean, he got a lot of flack for example, for working in countries which had dictatorships and mm. 
mm. this and that. And he said, look, my job is not to decide who governs. That's for the people of that country. My job is to provide services to, pe you know, to mm -hmm. poor people. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to worry about who's in power. I'm going to go out and serve people. And I think that has been really, that's informed our work in the last one year, for example, in Afghanistan. Because we've had this internal, you know, we've had this internal debate. Now that the Taliban are back, should Brack stay there? Mm. Or should we pull out? Because we, don't, we obviously don't you know, see eye to eye with the values and the ethos of the Taliban. But again, we thought, what would he do? And we, we, we came to the conclusion he would have said, you go and you make sure that girls in Afghanistan are being educated. And you don't worry about whether it's Taliban or, or Hamid Karzai or Ashraf Ghani who's in power. You know, you can't wait for, you can't pick your, you can't pick your governments, right? But you also can't allow a generation of girls in Afghanistan not to be educated because you're sitting there with your ideological right. position. Right. So you've got to yeah. go, out, go ahead and do the work. Um, BRAC is about to celebrate, is celebrating its 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. The world has changed in that 50 years. Um, just last month, the United Nations General Assembly were embarking on a discussion of shift even towards the attitude of poverty, from poverty alleviation to uh, global equity and justice. Where is BRAC now, and where is it heading in, in so many different ways, ideologically, practically? Um, where are you heading to? Yeah, thank you. So. Um, I think for us, um, we see that there are lots of challenges in the world. Um, there, and we feel as, you know, as we have over the last 50 years that we come from the developing world, we've learned a lot of lessons working with very poor people in the developing world, and we can apply those lessons across um, a lot of the countries where we have high levels of poverty, high levels of illiteracy, high levels of disease. So the short answer I would say always is that, you know, as my father said before he passed, just keep growing, um, look at how you can have impact at scale, work in holistic and multifaceted ways so that you're not just doing one little thing in one little place, you're looking at poverty as a, as a whole and people as whole and, and, and trying to address different things that come with it. But I think, you know, to a bigger point, I mean, if, you know, from, from where I am now heading BRAC International, which is all of our work outside Bangladesh, right? I see, you know, all of my peers in the development space, I mean, these are almost entirely made up of development organizations that have come from the global north, right? And uh, there aren't that many development organizations like, like ours that come from the global south. You mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, and it's a very different way of working. So usually, most development organizations coming from the global north will come in with the money because they have offices in the global north they can, that can raise large amounts of funding from the bilaterals and the multilaterals and the foundations in the global north. They come and that then they will find people, organizations in the global south to do the field work. So they subcontract out the main work to local organizations. But it's the global north organizations that have the relationship with the donors and ultimately has sort of do the grants management and the monitoring evaluation and it's sort of southern local organizations that do the actual work on the ground. BRAC is one organization we, we've said that doesn't work for us, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to be a subcontractor to a global north organization or even worse to a global north contractor, mm -hmm. right? Um, who are good at raising the money and then come and we are, we are subbing to these primes and these primes get all of the, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's their program, but the program is being run by us. So for us, it's very important, even being a Global South organization, that we learn to, we, we find the solutions to problems, mm -hmm. that we scale, our, we scale our work, and that we, we own it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and for us, uh, from Brack's perspective, there's a lot of problems in the world. We're not going to solve all of it by ourselves. We're only probably going to do a small amount of that. We want to collaborate with others. But we want to hold on to that ethos that we come from the global south, we've worked with the poor, we understand problems maybe a little bit more deeply, mm. 
than others coming from outside. Mm, and we beautiful. want to take that learning to many more countries and impact many more people. Beautiful, beautiful. I have to say, as we wrap up, there's a, it's, it feels to me a beautiful uh, circle between uh, BRAC and our awardees uh, today, uh, the Norwegian uh, Refugee Council, and both uh, organizations came from utter pain mm. uh, in Norway. It came from right after or during World War II and BRAC in the midst of uh, the independence war. Mm. And both organizations so the wretch uh, witness the wretched of the earth as not as the other as in as mm. inside as our people and came out of it with hope perseverance love i would say um and definitely triumph it's the triumph of hope over um, all the other misery that uh, are in the world so okay. your father stood for that BRAC stands for that norwegian people's council i mean uh, refugee council stands for that and Everyone in here stands for that. So we may uh, always um, triumph with that hope, um, hope over faith. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this conversation. Thank and you. thank you everyone for listening to us. Thanks a lot. It is now my turn to re-welcome to the stage Soledad O'Brien, who is joined by Angeline Moramirwa, Executive Director, Africa, from CAMFED, recipient of the 2021 Hilton Humanitarian Prize. Because Angie was unable to join us in person for a discussion last year, we could not pass up the opportunity to hear from her live on stage today. Angie was one of the first young women supported by CAMFED, Campaign for Female Education, to go to school in Zimbabwe, is a founding member of the CAMFED Association, the Pan-African Network of 208,000 women leaders educated with CAMFED support, working to secure every girl's right to quality education. Angie brings the expertise of young women, once excluded from education, to inform policy and strategy at every level. She has been recognized as one of the 100 most influential women by BBC and has received more accolades than we have time for today. <laughs> you know Soledad O'Brien, but where, what bears repeating is that in 2011, with her husband, Soledad founded the Pow Her Full Foundation with the mission of, to get young women to and through college. If only Soledad and Angie could have seen the cheering that took place in our office when this session came together, both because the topic is so important and because we could think of no one better than Soledad to help us all learn from Angie and the work of CAMFED. So with that, please help me welcome to the stage Soledad O'Brien and Angeline Moramirwa. Hello. Hi, Soledad. So we're doing this in person a year after. Finally. <laughs> finally, finally, yeah. which is a tremendous honor for me. What a great opportunity. Um, we obviously honored um, CAMFED virtually a year ago, and so it's great to have a chance to really hear from you about the organization uh, today. So you were one of the first young women that was supported by CAMFED uh, to go to school in Zimbabwe. Yeah. And, um, Today, you're the executive director uh, of Africa. So let's go back to the very beginning and talk about how you first came to CAMFED or how knowledge of CAMFED first came to you. Wow, thank you so much. I'm super excited to be doing this with you in person, you know, finally. So when did I make my first contact with CAMFED? I was 12. I was super excited, but anxious and sad combination, right? I had just received my primary school leaving certificate exams. I had not just done very well, I had trashed the school record for pass rate, not just the school one, it was the best you could get nationally. Wow. But this was my last act. I knew that there was no way my parents could afford 
to support me through secondary school. We just didn't have the money it would take. So I said, if I'm going to go out, I'll go out with a bang. So, <laughs> so I, I knew that, and my parents knew that. So that's why it was, I've done what I said how to do, but there is no future here. Fortunately, at that point, that's when Comfort was starting to work in my community. So my community selected me for support, and well, my story changed from that point on. You know, from just seeing the end to actually, Oh, this is so real? I, I couldn't believe that it was so real. To be honest, I think for the first few weeks and months, I kept thinking, maybe they'll come back and say they've rethought. Because <laughs> how can somebody come in and say they'll pay all school game costs? I even have a new uniform. I've got stationery. And to be honest, for the first time, I didn't know my shoe size. That's how bad it was. To the point that everybody was saying six, six. I said six. Turned out it was small. I was a size eight. My feet had grown too mm. big. So, so just to be back in classroom and to know that the future waited for me. So that was my first contact with Comfort. And I haven't had Comfort ever since. Talk to me a little bit, and you gave us some insight, but mm. what did KEMFED do for you over the years? Because obviously it's what has led you to continue your relationship with the organization. Yeah, it's, I'll try and crash this. Come on, I'm old, right? So I've lived. <laughs> so KEMFED not only provided me with school game cards. You know, these are things that my parents could not meet. But they made sure that my community was there with me. So I was selected by the community, so I was a community child. So everybody, every milestone, everybody was interested in what I was doing. Let's not talk about the pressure, but just the community <laughs> celebration there. But also, you know, just besides that, for me, the reason I have stayed with Comfort is the opportunity that it gave me, but also for millions of girls in my community. Come on, they are breathing, living, talking evidence of the work of Comfort's investment. But not just that, when I left primary school, right, there were my peers who didn't get the chance. So for me, I know what I could have become without the opportunity. So working with Comfort allows me to make sure that that doesn't happen again, that other children don't have to wait their turn and their chance, that we can do something now while we're breathing, living, whatever we can do. And I'm so proud to say that, you know, with my fellow sisters, you know, the Comfort Association. Tell me about that, because you're a, <laughs> we mentioned in your introduction yeah. that you're a, a founding member. So explain to everybody what Comfort Association is. Uh, I think it was mm. 208,000 yeah. members was the number. Talk about yeah, that. Yeah, and we'll be hitting 225,000 by December. Wow. It keeps growing and, you know, getting stronger. So I'll just tell you a bit about how we started the Comfort Association. So. In 1998, around 400 of us had been supported through school by Comfort. At that point, I didn't realize we were that many. Mm -hmm. I thought we were just 21, because at my school, we were 21. So, but when we got into that room, so there was a meeting organized for all of us to come and talk about, so where were we at, what were we planning, and what was going on. I'll tell you, we had a pity party. Like, we, we were all so excited we had gone that far. We are the first in our communities to have gone that far. We were not prepared for that. The world wasn't prepared for us because girls like us dropped out at grade seven. So when we're in that meeting, we're talking about, so how was it? How was it to, I like the power of perseverance. How was it like holding on to the chance to go through school? How was it keeping your eyes on the light and saying, I'm going to do the best I can with this opportunity so that it keeps there. But then to graduate into an abyss, Mm. There are no opportunities. There is, you don't know what to do. Nobody within your community can advise you on college opportunities and what to do because, you know, you're the first amongst your community to be able to go that far. So for us, we had a pity party in that we started crying, like, like seriously. So how can we go so far and see the promised land and then, ah. and then I missed it all. We're like, but we're better off. What is it that we can do now? What is it that we can do? Because there are other girls who are back there. How can we support them? So we started the Comfort Association to build a peer support network, to be there for each other, to support each other as we navigated life after school, as we navigated a world that wasn't prepared for girls from such marginalized backgrounds as ours to be able to start interfacing with employment, entrepreneurship, and you know, education, but also to be able to say, how do we help the next generation? Because we didn't want them bruised like we were. We didn't want them to have to, Yes, we want them to persevere, but not the same pace, drudgery, and everything like we did. How can we make it faster, easier, and better for them? How can we make schools also understand what it means to be a girl like that in the school? So that's how we started the Comfort Association. Now, many years later, 
over 210,000 members set to reach 225,000. We continue to do that, support you know, the next generation, but at the same time, continue to do the best that we can with the education opportunity that we've got. I like that phrase, uh, graduate into the abyss, yep. because it's the high and then of course the low. Explain yep. to everyone what that abyss looked like and felt like for you that you are changing for young women today. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> I, I told you we're a pity party. So this is how the pity party looked like. <laughs> So, you know, you, you got the opportunity to go to high school. Amazing. Everybody else in the village didn't get a chance. The community sat together and chose you to be one of their children to go there. There are high expectations around, oh, you're the one who knows what it means to go to secondary school. So what is it that you're going to bring? There is high expectations there. But there's also high expectations of yourself. I tell you... For me, every day sitting in that classroom, I knew that I wasn't just doing it for me, mm. I was doing it for every other girl like me. And sitting in those classrooms, some teachers struggled with us. They, they didn't know if a girl would sit in class and be thinking about what is everybody else eating at home. I had guilt conscience about getting a chance and my peers didn't were equally good. Mm. So the abyss was, so what's next? How do I even apply for a job? Mm -hmm. You know, where are the universities? All the universities were out of our locations. And we only knew the local teachers that were in the community. I love teachers, bless the teachers. But that's all we knew. So everybody wanted to become a teacher. Everybody wanted to become a nurse. Because all these things around lawyers, around our country, we didn't know about them. But then, you know, you've got the results, you've got the pass mark. And so where do I go? Where do I even go to go and apply? I, so the, the abyss was the world wasn't prepared for us, you know. It was prepared for people who would maybe go to the urban area, stay with siblings or relatives, apply for a job, and get that. What we're doing now as an organization, we have a whole guide program. So guides are young women activists who support others to transition. So they sit down with a young woman and say, oh yeah, sister, Welcome to the world. This is what it's going to look like. These are your opportunities. What would you want to do? Employment, entrepreneurship, education. If you want to do all of them, that's fine. But this is how the journey looks like. So university opportunities, now everything is online. But the reality is that not everybody is on the grid. So they sit down with a young woman and say, sister, this is how you apply before you're timed out, of course. This is the documents that you need. Let's scan them, and this is how you put them. These are the various courses that are available, and we do that even from when they're in school. So there is somebody who is walking the young woman through this abyss. It's not a place of, what did I get myself into? It's a place of, oh, we've got this, and we're going further. Yeah, it sounds very lonely when you were going through that path. Oh, it was tough, and that's why we started the Comfort Association, so that nobody feels that isolated again. You know, it's confused feeling, excited and anxious, not God. You talk about tremendous growth. You said yeah. 225,000 is what you're looking at uh, yeah, in the December. first quarter. So why? Explain that growth to us. That's remarkable. Yeah, well, we, we have continued to keep girls this generation in school. That's why I love the previous speakers when they're talking about we cannot afford to have a whole generation of girls, of course, and boys waiting their turn. Mm -hmm. That's not right. And it's a tragedy that there are still millions of children that are out of school right now as we speak. So we continue as an organization to keep girls in school. And I just want to be able to say that as I speak to you right now, the Comfort Association as a network, as young women, we support more girls through school than the organization that supported us, so than Comfort itself. So talking about the multiplier, talking about local philanthropy, is the young women that were supported through school that are supporting more children than funds that we get from donors and philanthropy externally. So that's big, that's huge. So, and we continue to sustain that. So we continue to have young women graduate and they sign up, it's voluntary. You're not forced to join the Comfort Association, but our sign up rates are over 98%. <laughs> so, but for us, it's what can you do? What can you do for the next generation? It needs to be faster, easier, better for them. That's what we are here for. So we continue to do that at every single day. And I just want to say that, you know, for Comfort right now, Comfort is led and driven by the young women that led the I know you're seeing me only, but I'm the least influential person in that network. We've got- Hang on while I roll my <laughs> eyes. Okay, carry on. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, no, I'm, I'm just serious. We have got phenomenal young women. I, 
I have stayed partly because it's very intoxicating, mm. right? So, you know, I can tell you about multiple young women. Okay, let's talk about Primrose, for example. So, Primrose uh, survived a fire when she was young, and she spent most of her time in hospital because she had severe burns and everything. Come on, she grew up, went to school through comfort support. She's a physiotherapist. Right now, her passion is to work with families and girls and boys who are living with disabilities. Mm. So, she is yes in terms of this is what it personally means so that intimate experience cannot be underestimated that's that's primrose right i can talk to you about fatima fatima is from ghana she's a midwife so she's a nurse with midwifery cost but for her she was like no a lot of people are dying in childbirth so yes she's a nurse she's got a full-time job but she spends time in a community talking about safe motherhood talking about what it takes talking about why it's important to delay motherhood why it's, you know all of those things but she says that in a language that people can understand. Because she knows the fears, the anxieties, and the language of this. This is exactly what people are afraid of. I've always said for me, I'm still waiting for that world where parents need to be educated on the value of education. Mm. Because I haven't seen that person. I haven't seen, I know every mother, every father, every parent, they want the best for their children. Mm. But I've read in books that their parents in my continent in my country that don't want their children to be educated. I'm still to meet them. Yeah, so I'm just saying that, you know, <laughs> together we are working to be able to make sure that there's no misconceptions and assumptions around the world that we want to create for ourselves. So the title of this session is Girls Education as a Catalyst for Change. What does that mean for you? How do you see that phrase and that framing? You know, I know people have heard a lot about this, right? And Everybody says, I've always said, people think they know. I've lived it, right? I've, I've lived it. I, I witness it every single day. Education is so important. It's not just about what you do in the classroom. It's about what that inclusion means, right? And it's about what you can go on and do about it, right? I was talking to you about Fatima, who is a mid, I, I, you know, young woman like Fiona, who is a lawyer now. So for me, it's, it has to start from there. We, we can talk, not talk about social justice, we're going to talk about climate justice, we're going to talk about you know, economic justice without allowing girls and young people the opportunity to sit in a classroom and get the education that they need. Because the young women that you're mentioning by name, they go on to bring the bigger change. Oh yeah, and they go on to lead that from a place of understanding. Mm -hmm. and, it, and to be honest, you know, we're like, a dog with a bun <laughs> when it comes to keeping a girl in school and, and making sure that there's nothing that stands in the way for every child. I believe every child should have the freedom to choose who they want to be and where they want to go. And that comes from education. Uh, to be honest, exclusion is powerful. I've seen what happened to my peers who didn't get the chance. I don't, I don't want that for any child. I don't want that for my children. I don't want that for any other child anywhere to have your life change so drastically just because you didn't get that opportunity. It's, it's unfair, and it's not right. This year's uh, recipient of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize, as you know, is the Norwegian Refugee Council, dedicated to people, so many people now, who have to flee their own land, because, of course, the climate crisis is highly correlated to displacement. So can you can make that connection between mm -hmm. girls' education mm -hmm. and climate crisis, and really, helping fight against a climate crisis. Sure, and just to say congratulations to the Norwegian Refugee mm -hmm. Cancer. You guys are doing fantastic work. I'm most impressed by the fact that you're going where few want mm -hmm. to go, yeah. where the limelight isn't, mm -hmm. and just doing what needs to be done. And, and I love the fact that you're deliberately focusing on protecting their rights with dignity. That's big, keep it up. Now let's go to climate, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I've, I've had people ask me, you, you're supposed to be a girl's education program in women empowerment? I think the connection is not always clear for Exactly, everyone. and people are like, you know, isn't that mission creep? I, I, I like that, you know, I was preceded by the previous speakers because they talked about intersectionality. As an organization, we started getting involved in climate action because the young women that we support saw the centrality of it in their community. Mm -hmm. We come from communities where 60 to 80% of the food is produced by women. 
And let's keep this in mind. These are women who don't have land rights. Mm. These are women who do not have access to inputs and resources. And these are women who themselves have not been to school, the majority of them. So for our young women, they saw that unless we also invest in this space, this is going to be a challenge. And, you know, imagine you're in a community where people don't know what exactly is going on. The climate shocks are coming. The cyclones are coming. And you think God is angry. You know, God is angry with us. We need to pray a bit more. But how do you <laughs> make sure that people understand the science behind it, but also build their power to be able to respond to it? And that is why we get involved in climate action. Seriously, you know, is it rivers are flooding that use not to flood, mm. right? And what happens when such shocks happen and people are displaced? Schools are commandeered as accommodation and schools learning doesn't happen because of it. So for us, we've got young women that are agricultural guides. So our guides, our activists, these are young women who are acting in their various communities. And these are young women that are interested in climate smart action, but who are also experienced and have expertise in it. So what they do is they go to communities and help them to adapt, to look into what is it that communities can do now. Issues around, can you look at your accommodation? Can you look at where it's placed? Can you look at food security? So food security is a big issue. Hungry children don't learn. So we have got communities now that look into how do you increase yields without compromising the future? How do you use indigenous practices but also bring in innovation as you do that? So our whole climate action work is based on helping adaptation but also helping people to understand that, you know what? It's not God who is angry. There's a science to it and this is what you can do. And this is said in very local, homegrown language because we know what people think, we hear what the community is saying, and it's you know, coming back to that and saying, this is actually where things sit, and we use that trust capital to do that. The theme today is the power of perseverance. What does that mean to you? As you were describing sort yeah. of the loneliness of, of feeling like you were timing out with yeah. nowhere to go and unclear of how you would make your next steps, um, that sounded like a lot of perseverance was required, but that of course has changed. What does the power of perseverance mean to you? You know, Peter Lawrence said this last night, and I thought, oh, that's the best definition of you know, perseverance. I've lived it best, but I don't. So you say it's about hope, it's about action, it's about commitment, right? And, and for me and for comfort, I see that in the young women that we work with and in our work. So let's talk about COVID. When COVID hit, we had a crisis, as if people don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows we had a crisis. But what happened in the communities in which we work, which are the most marginalized and remote communities, most aid workers started leaving mm. because they too wanted to go with their families. Teachers that were coming to the communities from outside also started leaving. So communities were basically left on their own to figure out what was going on. We know the world didn't know either, so people were figuring out what exactly is this about and meat started coming in. But for me, I am so proud to be a member of the Comfort Association because Young women members of our network realize that in this crisis, education is under threat. Safety and safeguarding of girls is under threat. And so what do they do? Tech action. So they went back to communities, and to be honest, you know, where you go, you get a message around, COVID is this, this, this. They go back, sitting on wells, like, you know, where you know, people go and fetch water, firewood, talking to communities to explain what was going on, and saying, you know what, we need to continue to invest in education. So they were holding study circles, study groups in the village, keeping learning going, and of course, you know, taking prompt action to children that they knew that this child's family circumstances was not well, they risk actually just falling out of school. So how do we help them to continue learning? For me, the fact that we had young women university students going and printing out learning material and going village to village, talking to people, supporting children's learning. For me, if that's not perseverance, <laughs> you know, just, just the stubborn hope that schools will open and we will be able to, to continue. For me, that's phenomenal. Because come on, these are young women that were supported through school by comfort because they're emerging from poverty themselves. They could have looked at this and said, we need to survive ourselves. So we did that. And you know, to the point that you know, even the ministries of education in countries that we work in, we had our learner guides on, on radios because they realized the work that was going on. We had learner guides on radio talking to 
young people about. This is what it means. Please also, you know, continue to your learning. Can we do revision now? Can we talk about how you can keep yourself and the community safe? But also not just that. Most of the content that we had, self-help study guides designed by the Comfort Association, were actually the only learning material mm. most of them had. To the point that after, you know, I won't say after COVID, when school started opening, right, over 90% of the children that our alumni network was working with came back to school. Mm. And that's way higher than in most contexts where we're not. So that's for me, the power of perseverance. The, the work is obviously transformational, but mm -hmm. there are obstacles. Let's talk about some of those obstacles. What are those things that you're finding at this moment that are in your way? Like I said earlier on, I, my heart breaks that we still have millions of children out of school. It breaks that the majority of them are girls because I know the power of that opportunity and what it makes. So in terms of some of the challenges that we still navigate, COVID exposed the inequality that exists. And I pray that we're not going to build back to where we were because that world was unequal already. Mm -hmm. So how do we build forward better? How do we ensure that the digital divide that exists is, exists is not an issue? How do we build on the lessons that we have learned? So for me, the whole issue around COVID and post-COVID, that, that remains an issue. But also climate crisis. You know, we have food insecurity issues that are coming across. We have cyclones, we have climate shocks, we have schools getting disrupted, closed, I know like in India they close schools for some time. All of that, that's, that's real. How do we help communities to continue to adapt? But most importantly, how do we continue to make education relevant and responsive to the realities of children today? What about those things that you're seeing as tremendous opportunities that are exciting for you right now? Well, I, I love the fact that we got the Hugh Tone Humanitarian mm. Prize <laughs> when we got it, right? And, and for me, it was because at that time, most schools were either closing or were just opening. I think for me, that's a very strong statement that education is non-negotiable. To be honest, it takes almost losing that opportunity to realize that. And it breaks my heart that some people take it for granted. But, but for me, that's, that's big. But I also just want to be able to say that um, as an organization, we're working at how do we do things at scale. So I talked to you about our work that Lena guys did to make sure that children continue learning, that they were able to come back to school and stay in school. So we're working with governments across all the countries that we work in to be able to look into how do we ensure that every learner has got a learner guide, a young woman who can accompany them on their way through school to navigate the issues that are in school and outside school. The exclusion that happens, you know where your participation at times, you are in class in person, you are worried about what's going home, or you, you actually, your attendance is infrequent because you've got child caring responsibilities. So for us, we're looking at, you know, we can't just focus on the child being in school. How do we make sure that that experience is priceless? We have obviously lots of people in this room, and then of course the live stream as well. Mm -hmm. I think often people try to figure out how to get in to help. What, what can they do from where they are? What would be your, your advice and your answer to those who are trying to figure out their way in to be helpful in the needs that you have and the needs that I think lots of organizations have? Uh, you said earlier on when you were speaking that COVID exposed how we are all very connected. Mm. And I just want to say that it's not comfort, duty, responsibility, and prerogative, and monopoly to educate girls. We all can do that. It's, and and l let's rally behind the movement of educating each and every child so they at least have their own opportunity to shape their life. So I would say, you know, invest in education, continue to support children in whatever way and manner that you can. Yes, the money is still needed. I know there's a lot of talk around free, free education, free. It's not free for the poorest. There are costs that are incurred, so please meet that cost. It takes eighteen dollars a month to support a girl through school. So please, you know, invest that. Second thing, like I said, join the movement. You know, do what you can within the community that you can and externally to be able to support children. Support a child that's out of school. Make sure that it's offensive for you to see a child who's out of school and, and support them. And third, if you go on at comfort.org, you find other ways that you can act today for today's children and make sure that they also don't wait their turn. We've got our million days campaign that's there as well, just for a suggestion, but please go there, you'll find a lot of ideas. And please just ask those that are at the co-face of the challenge. They will tell you what they need now mm. and today. Please don't spend too much money on awareness raising for our parents. 
they know the value way too much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Angie Murumiwa and Cam Fed, the honorees from 2021. What a pleasure and what an honor for me to be able to have this conversation in person. Real pleasure. Thank Congratulations you so to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. I will shift uh, back to my MC duties now, and I have the pleasure of introducing a panel that is central to today's discussion. The next session is called Refugee Resilience, Guiding the Way Forward, and it's going to be moderated by Foundation President and CEO uh, Peter Lawhung. In just a few hours, the Foundation will be presenting the 2022 Hilton Humanitarian Prize to Norwegian Refugee Council. And this session will therefore look at structures that have to be put in place for the successful integration of refugees, whether in place where there are strong integration systems or places that are less welcoming, including the importance of public-private partnerships. And we hope for that discussion to focus not only on challenges and barriers that limit integration, but also on the successes that can be shared as examples to emulate. This session will also look at how the expertise of individuals experiencing forced displacement or having experienced it must be part of developing solutions. I'm gonna let Peter introduce our panelists who are all experts in their fields, but please welcome to the stage Peter Lawharn and John Thorn Thon Majok, Zarlash Halamzai, and Sana Ala Ali Mustafa. Welcome. Thank you, Silver God. Uh, and I promise everyone this will be a lively, informative, and inspiring conversation uh, on an important topic. Now, uh, as, as Soledad said, we have uh, three very knowledgeable and experienced people on this panel who have all themselves experienced displacement, been refugees, and devoted their life's work to humanitarian and refugee uh, efforts. So they can talk about it from the inside and, and from the effort to, to build a system and strengthen it. Um, we have with us Jonathan Majok, who is the director of the Refugees and Forced Displacement Initiative at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars, and from South Sudan originally. We have Zarlasht Halamzai, who is the founder and CEO of Amna, and from Afghanistan originally. And we have Sana Ali Mustafa, the CEO of Asylum Access. Uh, and as you know, you've heard today, one of the foundation's uh, strategic initiatives is in refugees. And we are committed not only to work with the global system, but also, and very importantly, to work with refugee-led organizations. Today, there are, as you've heard, over 100 million people worldwide who've been displaced from their homes, more than 1% of the global population, and over 30 million of them are refugees. Uh, and you know, we, we have put a lot of emphasis, rightly, on the difficulty on the challenges, on the vulnerability of, of refugees. We've talked about the importance of compassion and solidarity. But I think what the tone of this conversation is, is uh, much more about admiration for strength, for resilience, and for resourcefulness, and how refugees are actors, in, in not only in the future of their, their refugee community, but also of the host countries that they come to and, and often of the, the, the countries they return to. Um, so I'd like to start off really hearing a bit about the stories of each of you. Uh, and could you tell us a bit about, uh, about the displacement and then how it led to the work that you're doing? And so now perhaps we can start with you. Sure, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for having us here and uh, for everyone for being here. Um, so yeah, my name is Sana Ali Mustafa. Um, I'm originally from Syria. I was born and raised there. And I was born to a very political family that you know, lived under a dictatorship and still on, of ongoing dictatorship like many other um, countries in the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, and I always mention how it was very important growing up navigating um, the public sphere versus the private sphere, where in the public sphere, we just had to not exist um, no opinions exist, nothing <laughs> exists, whereas in the private sphere, my parents were very um, 
eager to make sure that we are aware of what's happening in our environment and it's not normal that you know we don't have our freedoms and um, all the, uh, the oppression that was happening. And so that led when the Syrian revolution started in, in March 2011. My family and I were the first to take over the streets as well, protesting alongside so many other Syrians, demanding freedom, justice, um, and state of law in Syria. And so the situation in Syria started as a revolution, people-led revolution. Um, and we paid the price for that. Um, we, myself and my sister and my father, got detained um, by the Assad regime. We got released and then we continued until 2013 when my father um, was taken by the Assad regime for the third time um, and he, he has been forcibly disappeared ever since. So it's been nine years since we've known mm. anything about my father, if he's alive or dead, and that's the situation of 100,000 of Syrians. Um, and as a result, they came after the family and my mom, my sisters um, smuggled to Turkey. I had just made it to the US for um, what was supposed to be a summer school, and um, I was you know, informed I can't go back home, so I seek political asylum, and I suddenly became a person of forced displacement. Uh, I found myself in a situation where you know, I was deprived of everything. I had lost my home, um, my, my father, you know, knowledge of his presence, um, you know, money, leg legal documents, all of it, and I started my journey here trying to you know, just um, get my rights. And I think that was the first thing I was able to seek my, my asylum in the US, uh, my political asylum, and then, you know, trying to make my way through this. Um, but I always say the one thing that I, or the two things that I absolutely have always had, even when I lost everything, were the values that my parents planted in me um, and the Syrian revolution mm -hmm. uh, also planted in me, and then also my, my voice. Uh, which no one can take away, and those are the tools that really still guide my way forward. And then animate your work in asylum Thank action. You. Powerful. Thank you. Zarlasht, your story. Um, there's so much um, that I can relate to <coughs> from what you said. Um, so my family, a very ordinary family, um, was, you know, from Kabul and um, we had very ordinary aspirations, you know, to go to school, um, to get jobs, to get married. Um, but we were living in a pretty extraordinary time um, in the 80s where, you know, two superpowers were clashing in Afghanistan, uh, which led to a lot of violence. Um, and so my parents really made a very difficult decision to leave our home uh, and what we thought would be a temporary thing. Um, we went to the neighboring country. Um, and the idea was what, that we would wait out the violence and go back home, which is very typical of refugee experience. Uh, a lot of refugees move to neighboring countries in the hope that they can go back home at some point. Uh, but like many, many refugees around the world, um, it became very clear that we couldn't go back home. So after four years, as the Taliban took over the country, um, my parents realized that going back home was completely untenable. My mom was a teacher. She had spent her entire life teaching and educating girls. So the idea of going back to a Taliban-ruled country was just not something she could deal with. Um, so we sought asylum in the UK, and um, after four years of waiting around, um, and that's, you know, that's when we started kind of our new life. And you know, a sort of prevailing myth um, and, and displacement stories that once you arrive in your final destination, that when you're, you're safe and things begin to you know, sort themselves out. Uh, but really it's the beginning of a whole new set of challenges. And it was, you know, suddenly we had to deal with integrating into a new culture, learning a new language, dealing with a bureaucracy that we'd never dealt with, um, you know, kind of going through the asylum process, which is incredibly traumatic. You're asked to recount your story mm -hmm. over and over again. Um, and that led to a whole host of other problems for my family. And I remember as a, as a teenager, I really found it difficult um, and, you know, really was feeling quite a lot of anger and just found it very difficult to be um, in school. And so I was referred to 
um, you know, a psychologist and a therapist. And what became very, very quickly apparent is that they had no idea what to do with someone like me. Um, and I spent most of my time educating them mm -hmm. about my background and where I was from and my identity. And, and this experience really stayed with me. And then as, as a humanitarian, I was working on the Turkish-Syrian border for about 18 months uh, in 2014, 2015, which was an incredibly horrible time and during the mm -hmm. Syrian war and people were going through horrific violence and there was no, literally no provision for trauma care. And so it became very clear to me that, you know, seeing my own experiences reflected in, in Syrian children, I wanted to do something about it. So I founded the organization that I run, which is called Amna, and it's all about commu providing communities with safe spaces where they can um, process and heal um, as groups, as communities, and, 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 and contend with what's happened to them. Thank you so much. Please. Hey, Jonathan, how about you? I was born in a village in South Sudan, and I was a cowboy. Uh, <laughs> then the Civil War hit between the North and South Sudan, so I walked to Ethiopia, three and a half years in Ethiopian refugee camps. There was a political upheaval again in Ethiopia. Walking back to the border of Sudan, walk along the border to Kenya. And so I lived in Kenya for almost 10 years in the refugee camp in Northwest Kenya. A total of 13 years in the refugee camps and displaced camp. And as you heard earlier today, uh, from our inspiring poet, no one can send a child to the river unless you believe it is safer in the river than in the land. And that was the situation where we were very young and walk because it was believed that it would be safer to walk than to sit still in the villages we were born. And for the displacement is an assault on human dignity and it disrupted that life at the early age. But I came to cope with the adversity of, um, of refugee life in four different ways, which I call uh, the four resilient factors. One is my upbringing, uh, the way I was brought up, and, and the words of, uh, of my dad, uh, it became a, a frame of reference mm -hmm. when I f faced those adversities. Second, was the community network. So we were displaced in group. We were together 15, 16 to 20,000 unaccompanied children. And so we became our own family in exile in those refugee camps. So community network was important and it was a coping mechanism. And third is, is, is my religious faith. Gave me hope, it paved the way for you know, a better life to get meaning out of my suffering. <clears throat> and finally, a drive for formal education. My first uh, formal uh, education was under the tree in Ethiopia refugee camp, where my first exam was writing in a sand uh, on the floor. Uh, there were no notebooks. Um, so it became, it's, it became something that I could cling to because there were no cows anymore in, in the refugee camps. So these four resilient factors kept me going, and I think they fit within the theme of the power of perseverance today. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I think we could not have asked for uh, three stronger portraits of, of resilience and of taking a, a difficult situation and making it purposeful uh, and, and aiming it at making the system better. Jonathan, uh, several years ago you wrote an article that actually inspired the title of this session on refugee resilience. And, and you, you noted that although displacement and refugee status are an immense tragedy, they also show the great strength of, of the refugees, the dignity, the agency, uh, and resilience. So you've talked about what helped you move forward. 
Now as you talk to policymakers, as you talk to UN officials, the US government, as you talk to funders, how do you express that in, in policies and in systems? My dad tested my human agency when I was very young. Hmm. And this is what he told me. He told me to figure out, the word figure out, uh, figure out thing by myself so that I get to know better. He knew that I had a human agency even at that early age. So when refugees are given the opportunity to test their human agency, to utilize, um, you can see the result. And that's why human agency, uh, in terms of their capacity, their re resilience need to be recognized in any policy discourse. Because what live experience does is, 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 is that it broadens the perspective on certain issues. I was born in a village, I didn't know what's going on around the world, but I became, as I became a refugee, I knew different contexts and what is going on around me. And that experience, the live experience, cannot be, you know, it's not, it's not a research thing. Uh, it's, there's no substitute for it. And so I have, as I work on policy issues, and especially on protracted uh, refugee situation, because I have lived there for uh, more than a decade, I am thinking back of the people mm -hmm. that, were in the that are still in the same camp that I was in more than uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, it, it, imp it, it, it informs what I do, that it is part of me. There is another aspect of um, uh, of live experience is that the relatability. When you give refugees the opportunity to tell their narrative, others can relate to their stories and as they relate they can inform their political leaders to act. Experience show that you know when you relate to something mm -hmm you can effectively uh, address it. In literature, in social theory literature, of course, is that most of the successful social interventions are done by the people that are affected the most. Mm -hmm. So when you give people the opportunity to tell their story, um, they want to change things through their story and that's how policymakers can pick it up. So that's the perspective I bring uh, working on these refugee issues. Is just it has broadened my uh, perspective, but I also hoping that it can inform policymakers to read that refugees are not the problem to be addressed. Mm -hmm. They are mm -hmm. the symptoms of the problem. And so when they tell their stories. They, they should not be seen as others. They are our fellow human beings. They are our sisters, brothers, neighbors, mothers. And so that's the, the perspective that, that I think can uh, inform policymaking. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, Sana, let's talk a bit about global commitments toward refugees and displaced people. As you know, in 2016, the World Humanitarian Summit in, uh, in Istanbul made a commitment about funding flows, 25% to local organizations and about refugee-led and community-led efforts that would be supported. Where are we on that, and uh, why are we where we're at? Thank you. Is that work? It's working? It's yeah. Working. yeah. Apparently, I needed two mics. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Peter. I don't know how much people in the room familiar even with like localization. I feel it's a very specific sector terminology, but, but basically it's really, um, maybe the bigger context would be what John was talking about, that this situation, forced displacement, and so many other poverty, so forced displacement, um, so many of the issues that are happening in the global major majority are addressed, and the solutions are designed, and the decisions are made by people who are very far away from these mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. People who live and sit in the global north, people who make decisions on solutions for people in the camps in, uh, in Kenya. Um, and so the issue, this is the main issue 
in general in the humanitarian and development sector that historically um, these solutions that can, starting with the UN Convention, you know, were designed by people who are far from the lived experience and who are also geographically far from the context of where these um, crises are taking place. And so I think it's important to recognize the roots of our system, the colonial roots that still manifest until today. And so what has been happening in the last 10 years, um, there has been finally conversations about, oh, like maybe we should channel more resources to those who are on the ground to be part of leading solutions and programs. And this is when the conversation about localization started. But I mean, imagine that you actually have to localize solutions that have been targeted at the local people after 70 years because they were not localized to start with. Um, the issue right now is that with the definition of localization in, in the sector, it's, it's more about, it's thinking about how could local actors, and we understand local actors as including national govern uh, governments, um, local civil society, host community civil society organizations, and how can they be part of um, receiving more money, how they can be part of designing the solutions with the global actors, how they can integrate, that's the word Ekba <laughs> uses, how they can integrate into being part of the solutions and the mechanisms that the global organizations are designing. The problem was that we are not in this way really addressing that, well, what about the structure itself? Maybe re-examining the structure instead of re-examining how people could be part of the same structure that's not designed by the people to start with. And so my issue, my first issue, issue with localization, it does not address root cause power imbalance. I would call for power shifting. Uh, which is completely, it will, it will mean we have to examine, dismantle existing structures and system and rebuild them what, and let the people at, be at the heart and the center of leading, rebuilding those with those who have not experienced forced displacement instead of those who have not experienced forced displacement inviting me occasionally, you know, to be, uh, to be part of a systems they designed. And so, <laughs> thank you. And so back to those, you know, within lo so this is localization. Within this commitment to from lo uh, to towards localization from global actors, there have been numbers of occasions where they announced pledges and commitment towards let's do better in channeling more money. Again, in the first one, not shifting power, um, and in that one, there's the commitments from the, the global bargain and the World mm -hmm. Humanitarian Summit to give local organization more money. That commitment started with 2.8 in 2016, and as of 2.8% uh, of the money going to local actors in 2016. By 2020, it was 3.1. That's how much it increased. <laughs> so um, another example would be, you know, out of the $30 billion money circulating within the humanitarian system, we estimate less than 1% goes to refugee-led organizations, mm -hmm. which are subcategory of local actors. So we have national governments, host community organizations, local actors, and there's sub-marginalized category called refugee-led organizations. Like those are the initiatives led by, by the persons who've experienced forced displacement, and they have more barriers to exist. They can't register, they can't have bank accounts, all of that. So those people, like, let's, if we're talking about the women rights movement, so imagine women-led organizations would get less than 1% out of the money that's going to address women's mm -hmm. rights. So that's how yep. bad we're doing. Yep. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's not going well at all. <laughs> so I, 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 I sense a call to action coming. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. So right. there is a call to action and that to say, I mean, I'm not pessimistic at all, but I also like to acknowledge what's happening and then we can talk about ways forward. There are successful examples and there has been more conversations mm -hmm. about shifting power towards refugee-led organizations and those with lived experience. Mm -hmm. And there are now current examples and I wouldn't say from global institutions. Mm -hmm. I would not give them that credit to be honest. They have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But I would give the credits to a number of other uh, foundations. I mean, Hilton is one of them. Mm -hmm. We have OSF, we have Porticus, we have a number of foundations who are getting it and, and really channeling resources in significant fashion to refugee-led organizations to be able to address their own solutions. Thank you so much, Zana. Zalash, uh, what would you like the public to know about the, the situation of refugees, uh, both in terms of uh, 
the, the scale and the impact of forced displacement, but also the, the power of refugees. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm so inspired by yeah. what you both have said. Um, th there's, you know, isn't a, a neat answer to that, Peter, mm -hmm. but I think, so there's two things when I think about the refugee crisis. The first one is what's already been mentioned in the panel, which is refugees are not the problem, they're a symptom of, uh, of structures in the world and structures of violence um, that often have colonial roots. And the, a lot of the places that produce refugees have been um, subject to violence for a very long time. So for example, my home country, and uh, Afghanistan has been, you know, we've, Afghanistan has been at war for 42 years and many, many countries around the world have been involved in that war. So the first thing to understand is that people that are, the things that produce large, dis you know, numbers of displaced people are global structures. Um, and, and structures in which we're all complicit in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so gaining that understanding and, and, and the root cause of why people are fleeing their homes, which is usually conflict, inequality, poverty, all those things are, um, yeah, global structures of power. Um, and it's really difficult to kind of get into that and contend with a, the number, 100 million, so the second thing that I would say is an entry point for understanding is to really go down to what happens to an individual, to a human being um, when, they are, when they're displaced. And that's where we can really have, you know, there's a lot of universal things that happen to refugees that we all experience. So imagine experiencing loss, you know, of, you know, we all lose family members, people that we love. This is something that happens to refugees all the time. So when they're leaving their home, it's usually because something really terrible has happened and it pushes people out. You know, the kind of grief that you experience when you lose, first of all, your language, you know, your capacity to communicate, your points of reference, um, the things that give you joy and, you know, all of the, you know, I think these are all very universal human experiences which refugees experience in the extreme. Um, but what I've experienced in my own community, you know, um, as I'm pretty sure everyone in this room will know, Af Af Afghanistan went back to the Taliban the last year. And many, many women in my country who had spent 20 years fighting for their rights lost everything overnight. Um, but despite repeated assaults on, um, on the community that I come from, there is mobilization of women and young people, um, you know, going back and trying to do something and fighting um, in the communities that I work in now. There is so much hope, resilience, and joy. The organization that I run, we put joy at the center of what mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because, you know, that is the, the that's the, the, the kind of the ultimate outcome that we want for the community. It's intrinsic. We want to create conditions where people can feel that. And I experience that resilience, that joy, that post-traumatic growth every day in my practice. Um, and so going back to what my panelists have said, the communities that are experiencing this have the intelligence, the insight, the creativity, and the lived experience, the knowledge, the expertise that you need to really address what's happening. We just need to remove the barriers. Mm -hmm. We need to get out of the way um, for them to be able to really, you know, push for the solutions that we know work. Thank you so much. And all of you, have experienced a number of countries, of, of host countries and transition countries since you left your own. Uh, tell us your thoughts about how those societies, and, and I think you, you specifically all know the US quite well, uh, could work better to receive refugees, and what people in the room and online could do and think about in order to support that. And whoever would like to take the question. Yeah, let's go first. Yes. Um, displaced people and refugees face three structural forces 
that limit the opportunities and capacities. One are the displacing factors, obviously the push factors, what led them to live in the first place. If the displacing factors are still in the country of origin, those forces prevent them from returning. So they stay wherever they are in the host country. The second set of forces are the marginalizing forces that hinder their integration into host society. And those forces, those barriers include the lack of legal recognition in the host country, um, you know, the lack of political will to even uh, address their issues. So they are kept in the refugee camp, and encampment policy is a barrier to their integration. Example is Kenya, uh, kept people out of the the mainstream and put them in the refugee camp. So the marginalizing forces don't allow refugee to integrate. And then the third factors are the immobilizing forces that block their upward mobility. And so they will sit there, not going anywhere. They don't have freedom of movement, uh, no choice to expand their uh, human agency. Those immobilizing forces prevent them from even reaching the third uh, country for the settlement. And so we have to address these three structural forces to be able to allow the human agency of the refugees to be put in, 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 in use. Now the United States is a global leader in refugee resettlement, no question about that. Um, but I think, yeah, given the scale of the problem in the 21st century, uh, U.S. need to step up its leadership because then it's where others will follow. Uh, for example, we have the situation in Ukraine now, situation in Afghanistan, the Venezuela crisis, the Syrian crisis are some of the major uh, emergencies as we speak. But then there have been emergency situations that have existed for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. Those are, they, they are now at the back end of the attention. Um, I read an article in the New York Times yesterday that told a story of a Somali refugee mm -hmm. who had been trying to bring his two sons to join him here for seven years. And then it was told recently that, okay, this situation will resolve in the summer. Now the, Un the United States is not looking at those again, the backlog. The United States is addressing the situation of Ukraine, the Venezuela uh, situation, and, and those are now at the back. Now, resettlement from experience is always a hope when mm -hmm. you heard that you are going for a settlement. That is when you think, you know, you have a better future. But if this hope comes to an end, at some point you can imagine the situation the refugees are. And that goes back to the system itself. Do we have a resilient system that address the magnitude of crisis we are facing? This is where public-private uh, pri uh, partnership comes in. If the government cannot handle it, can the private sector come in? Can the private citizen come in? We talk about uh, private sponsorship of refugees. Mm -hmm. The Canadian system use that. And uh, the United States, I think, is piloting this. This is where the citizen can get involved to see what they can do if the government is not doing anything. But it all needs ha all hands on deck. And these structural forces are beyond the capacity of the, uh, the, the displaced people to address al alone. And mm -hmm. they are beyond the capacity of the host country this is why we need collective effort and partnership. So between the private sector, the philanthropic, civil society. Exactly. And refugee-led. And yeah. Sana, I see you have a thought. Yeah, yeah I mean, I fully <coughs> agree. Um, I mean, it has been proven. I mean, it, it, it's obvious, right? Like when we talk in the morning, we, we're talking about intersectionality, right? And now we understand in intellectual terms that the need to solutions to be addressed from all different dimensions. Mm -hmm. 
and obviously, as, as it was mentioned, this is not um, a new thing, right? Like, all feminist theorists from Audre Lorde to, to today have addressed the importance of, you know, you cannot look at immigration and refugee situation in the US without thinking about racism, without thinking about socioeconomic classism, mm -hmm. th without thinking about all of those things. So addressing these situations doesn't mean only putting a lens into it, actually mm -hmm. movements working together. And mm -hmm. I think this is the main issue is that in the forced displacement sector, in the refugee sector, we've been, we do things alone, we've been isolated and now in the refugee leadership movement, we are learning that the barriers we're facing about centering the lived experience mm -hmm. have been faced by the feminist movement, by the black movement, by the indigenous rights movement. They have been navigating the same barriers of w wanting agency over their own lives. And we have a lot to learn from and we have a lot to, to do together. But I want to go back also to your question about what could host community mm -hmm. and what could host governments and people do better. It matters who, I mean, so many people like refugees, it's um, you know, international situation, it's, like, uh, it's, um, it's not a domestic one, right? It's a very domestic one. And exercise your citizenship. <laughs> who you put in office does matter. When, when, I mean, I'm not sure about political views here, I'm gonna say my own experience. When the, travel, the Muslim travel ban happened in March 2017 by the Trump administration, my very own mother and sister got declined family reunification to come see me here after three years of being in process. So these policies do have impact on our lives, had impact on me as now a US citizen, being now an American, I cannot bring my family, had impact on my ability to feel stable here, to be able to integrate, to be able to contribute. And so exercising our citizenship here is important. And that doesn't only means like, you know, elections, it also, means giving attention, being, and if you, that doesn't matter, then at least exercise something about current issues, right? Because they do affect me. Like, I exist here with all my multi-layered identities, you know? I'm a woman, I'm a queer woman, I'm brown, and I'm a refugee, and I'm a Muslim, and, and even if I am not a refugee, those identities are enough bring me lots of struggle with the current system here in, the, in this country, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's important that really one fight, when we fight for one movement, by default we are fighting for other, for other movements and that's important to keep in mind. The last thing I wanna say, when there's the will, things change and we've seen that in Ukraine. It's a perfect, beautiful example. Mm -hmm. Exactly, this is how it should work. And we're not saying that we're, we don't like, we're un unhappy that Ukrainian refugees have been offered safety with dignity. But we're saying is that all refugees, regardless of their race and their ethnicity and background and gender, should have uh, be offered safety with dignity and not have to wait in camps for 20 years to potentially, only like 3% of refugees in the world get resettled and, not, and going through really undignifying processes. So that's an example that we should hold now governments accountable towards it. And you set the bar high by Ukraine, and let's make sure we don't accept that the bar goes low again. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we, we, we promised the audience some solutions as well. And I think we've given a lot of raw material and, and a lot of effort and potential. Um, I'd like to turn the conversation a little bit to the country of Colombia and, and what they have done. Uh, the audience may or may not be aware that uh, Colombia basically declared uh, Venezuelan refugees to have the same rights as Colombians, all the same rights except to vote, uh, and they gave them an amnesty for 10 years, uh, which speaks to what Jonathan had said about, about mainstreaming, about mobility, et cetera. Uh, and, and the percentage of their population that was involved is roughly equivalent to the percentage of undocumented people in the United States today. So I was wondering, Jonathan, if you could tell us a little bit about, about that experience, how it's gone, what, what can be um, presented to other countries? So it is a very, very good example of best practice in refugee integration, the situation of uh, the, what the Colombian government has done and to another extent, the Ecuadorian government integrating the Venezuelan refugees into their society. But I think it, it, it has to start from the top. It's, you know, the tone has to be set. And so the president of Colombia set a tone that these are our brothers and sisters. Let's treat them with dignity. They are our fellow neighbors. I think that's, that comes into the psyche of the average citizen that yes, let's look them as brothers and sisters. 
So when you set that tone, um, it can impact life in positive ways. And what the Colombian government has done is that it removed that psychological um, cloud in the mind of a displaced person that, oh, I am not recognized, I am not welcome in this society. And when you, you no know, example with our kids, when you talk, I have, you know, I have kids, and when you talk to them, they, they, they only know you and what you tell them, and if you tell them wrong information that can depress their life, it's, that's the same thing with the displaced people. If you think you are not welcome here, it, it will stick there because they wake, wake up every day that they are not welcome. But when you remove that cloud and, you know, have the welcome message, that's why we have, you know, any welcome message when somebody comes to our door because we feel good about that. So that's what the Colombian mm -hmm. government has done. Not other countries, I mean, not all countries have that. Example is the Kenyan government. And this is the, the country that hosts me for almost 10 years. They are very hospitable, we're grateful mm -hmm. for the, But the idea of keeping those fellow human outside, you know, the society in, in those camps does not help because those camps that were established in the 1990s are still there. How many generations of children have been born there? Why are we wasting their human potential? Can we take an example of the Colombian government to, to do that? Uh, so that it all goes back to leadership, mm -hmm. to, to set the tone and then citizen. I want to quickly point out that we don't want to allow the countries of origin to be free riders in this. I think mm -hmm. we want to hold them accountable. So when the U.S. leadership talk about the root causes, those countries should not receive foreign aid if they are not addressing mm -hmm. the root causes, why people are leaving those countries. And the same thing with the host countries, they should be supported. Uh, you know, responsibility sharing, but also resource sharing. Again, this is why public-private partnership mm -hmm. is important, mm -hmm. because you help the host countries, but you also establish refugee initiative in the host countries to help them with their livelihood, self-reliant initiatives, while they are waiting for the return or integration. Mm -hmm. We have to let them have something uh, to improve their lives there. Fantastic. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you each for a wrap-up um, call to action in five minutes or so. But in the meantime, let's tackle the global system. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I know you're doing this every day, but I, I, I'm struck by the similarity of spirit between the conversation between Zainab and Shamaran uh, and how BRAC started and what it grew into, and your spirit in this moment about a 21st century humanitarian system worthy of the name, form fit for the challenges that are in front of us. So just, I would love your, your guidance to the audience about what we should be doing now to help the system do what it needs to do. Well, I, I, can, I can have a go at yeah. sorting out the global system. Um, mm -hmm. I think the first thing is to have an honest conversation about the humanitarian system as a whole. Um, and so I'm really encouraged that we're having that conversation here. Um, it's a microcosm of the world, right? So all the kind of structures and dynamics of um, inequality, racism, power, you know, and unequal power dynamics exist within the humanitarian system. And I think being able to without blaming anyone, having a conversation about how those af affect the people that the humanitarian system is meant to serve is the starting point for looking for solutions. Um, I, th you know, as a, as a recipient, as a refugee who got, um, we got food packages when we were in Afghanistan, and there were some very strange things in our food package. <laughs> when we were, just things that we were like, we don't really need this right now, you know? And then as a humanitarian, um, also just kind of working with communities where you basically view them as passive recipients of aid. Um, and that creates all kinds of problems. First of all, you're not delivering services that are 
fit for purpose. Second of all, you're replicating the very same power dynamics that drive people from their home in the first place. Um, and so kind of reckoning with that, I think, is a really important thing. And it's not the people that work within the humanitarian system. I think the vast majority of people that have been my colleagues are committed to the service that they are providing. It's the structure. Mm -hmm. So going in, pumping lots of money for a short period of time, not building local community resilience. And Afghanistan is a really good case study. 20, for 21 years, humanitarian organizations were incredibly active in Afghanistan. And now that a lot of that's gone, there's very little to show for it. And I think it's kind of like, who's held, you know, how do we hold, is there any kind of accountability for that? How do we measure whether the aid that we're providing is actually doing what it says it does? So I think having an honest conversation and then talking about accountability and where that comes from could be a starting point. Fantastic. Sana? Of course I have thoughts. <laughs> Why not? I think I've been addressing the global system from mm -hmm. the beginning. Um, but I want to very much agree uh, with what has been said because, um, you know, you mentioned like, yeah, let's talk about the solutions. It is, we have to take time to acknowledge the problem. Mm -hmm. And we have to take time to acknowledge the history of the sector and its continuous manifestation. And, and we have to have these honest, brave, courageous conversations to be able to move, for, to move forward with reconciliation. Because the issue is that symbolic partnerships, tokenistic partnerships with local actors mm -hmm. are, are not going to work anymore. It doesn't work. We ha a lot of the refugee-led organizations have really major trust issues with global institutions. They have disappointed us for so long. I mean, imagine 70 years since the convention of the UNHCR, billions of dollars. And we still have camps without basic to access, access to basic human rights. Why would I trust? And I even, I, I always invite donors to think, why do we still give to the same people if there is no impact? Why do we still give to the same people who deliver solutions without dignity? Why do we still invest in the same exact actors who have become an industrial complex? So my invitation mm -hmm. here is to, to think to do things differently. I invite donors and those who hold power in any way or capacity to first look internally, mm -hmm. have conversations, have acknowledgement, and then create processes towards reconciliation internally in your organizations, institutions, and this organically would reflect on how you do things to the outside. Mm -hmm. You don't need to bring uh, gender lens when your teams are representatives organically. It just happens. It's, ma it's manufactured mm -hmm. into your products mm -hmm. on the outcome product. The second thing I would invite everyone, and especially, again, those who hold power, a part of the system to do is when you, after you've done your internal work, really think about, before you engage with anyone, about three questions. The what, the how, and the who. And all we do in the sector, we think about the what. How many times do we hear, this organization does amazing job. They have reached a million people. How? How did they reach this million people with dignity? How many people were traumatized on the way? What was the dynamic? Did that actually address something? And who are they? I mean, are they like this? Are they repeating, the perpetuating power dynamics that have been existing in the sector? If we do not look into equitable ways of working, then we are still, we are continuing to provide band aids, not solutions, and we are still not addressing inequity in the forced displacement sector. So looking into when you invest or partner with any organization, thinking about who's leading and how they are centering people with lived experience as part of their leadership and solutions and how their ways of working internally and externally in partnerships and funding are actually led by equity as a value and then how their what is addressing you know, their community. And I here would invite donors to take a step back from the what. Mm -hmm. It's not your business what, the, what they think the solution is. They know what's best for the community. So the solution is not in the what. The, the what changes from a place to another. The solution is in making sure that the who has the, the resources to be able to execute on their how, to be able to deliver to their communities what they need and how they need it. Thank you, Sunny. John Fon, it, it looks like we have come into our, our calls to action here. So why, why don't you give us yours? And no, I do agree that dialogue is a way forward, and that's what we do best at the Wilson Center. And 
with the <laughs> refugee and forced displacement initiative, this is our mission, to expand the space for constructive dialogue, using the live experience of the refugee to bring the new perspective to the discourse. And so, and one other thing is to emphasize again is that public-private partnership. Involve the private sector to bring with innovative uh, ideas on how to uh, uh, reform the, the global humanitarian system that has served us well for over 75 years, but it needs to be reformed. And the good news is the refugee people have agency, they are people with human dignity. If they are given the opportunity to figure out, they will help us to find the solution. Fantastic, Jonathan, thank you. Uh, I, I think no more needs to be said, really, about the power, the insight, the resilience, the resourcefulness, uh, and the partnership possibilities with refugee-led organizations and with uh, people at community levels. Uh, I would speak, though, to those in the room and those online. You all have influential positions in this world. Please take this to heart. Think about voice, think about agency, think about uh, a, a, a set of partnerships that will be more effective. Uh, we're in a century of dislocation. Let's, let's make our efforts really address that and resolve that. Uh, and you're all at the head of organizations. Tone starts from the top. It's a brilliant invitation for all of us. So please join me in thanking Sarlasht and Sana and Jantan today. So now we're going to watch a brief tribute to yet another individual who's been part of the Prize Laureate family for the past 17 years. The connection to the prize is that Partners in Health received the Hilton Humanitarian Prize in 2005. And I think uh, the video will speak for itself. Let's play that. First question is very simple, Paul. State your name and your title. I'm Paul Farmer. Uh, what do I say next? MD, Chief Strategist, PIH. I love that title, by the way. Founder, I'm proud of that. Um, first medical director. I wasn't qualified for that, but hey, I did my best. So there, there's some titles. I was driven after 1983 by this raw experience, and a very good one, is how do we make the work we're doing collectively matter? We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to build a clinic. How are you? The biggest struggles of my life have always been around the fight for social justice. What could be better than being an activist? It's something you're doing because you want to do it. It's not, some, not a job that you're you know, paid to do. It's something you choose to do. So I think that's a, a big deal, being an activist. None of our patients have died. One person died a few days after starting therapy because we started too late. And isn't that the lesson of the last 20 years? We started too late. If I break my leg, you're gonna, you're gonna fix it. We really believe that all people have equal value. And we can all build healthcare systems that are compassionate and merciful. To me, that is about hope, and it's about rejecting despair. You know, 
know, this work that we are so lucky to do is not just about diagnosing the problem, but about responding to it. And when you do, with even modest resources, the return on that investment is just incredible. This effort is motivated by love and should be informed by compassion and expert mercy. Is it okay to write bravo in a medical chart? I mean, you gotta love this job. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. Okay, Sherry. The Norwegian Refugee Council is an international organization working in more than 35 countries to support people forced to flee. Now, each of us could probably name two, three, or four countries with refugee crises, but many of them are forgotten and not in the headlines. NRC works in all of them. To them, there are no forgotten crises. NRC is there for people in their hour of greatest need in conflicts, in disasters, where there is a lot of suffering. What we hope is to be there in the hard to reach areas, we're there to help people according to their needs. Currently we have last year over 300,000 of people who had to flee their homes, making Yemen the largest humanitarian crisis and aid operations. NRC in Yemen plays a very fundamental and crucial role, and that includes some activities that are not currently provided by any other agency in Yemen, including the unconditional cash intervention, uh, the legal civil documents uh, intervention, and also the advocating for uh, housing, land, and property rights. Our humanitarian work is about safety, dignity, and rights. We are working with our local staff, and that makes the people believe us, they trust us. We always ask for guidance by those with lived experience. And in all our country operations, we are partnering with local organizations to ensure that our impact is amplified. As NRC, we have been working for more than 75 years. We believe that we represent those people that they want to change, rebuild, and make a better future. We speak on their behalf, we use their testimony without exposing them. Uh, and at times we're punished for that. We've been suspended because we spoke out for people under attack. Our success is measured in lives saved or lives lost. If we're not neutral, independent, impartial, we will fail uh, on the battlefield in the crossfire between armed groups we're unarmed, we have only the principles and, uh, to show for that we're there to help the civilian population. As an international organization, it's also impressive how NRC leverages its position to partner with international, national, and local actors to maximize collective impact, to ensure effective coordination, and to engage in advocacy efforts. The significance of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize is enormous, really. Uh, at this very moment, when we have more than 100 million people displaced for the first time in recorded history, we are challenged like never before, we're overstretched like never before, and to have this recognition of what is the world's, in my view, most prestigious humanitarian prize means a morale boost for our 16,000 field workers when we receive this kind of recognition from Hilton Foundation, we feel that we are not alone in those communities. We couldn't be more delighted to receive this humanitarian award. That gives us really the impulse to do even better, being more innovative, more proactive for the people we serve who are displaced and refugees who need us like never before.
Hello again and welcome officially to the 2022 Hilton Humanitarian Prize Ceremony. I have the great honor of introducing our next speaker, the esteemed Ms. Joyce Masuya, Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator at the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. In February 2022, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez appointed Joyce Masuya of Tanzania to this venerable role. She brings more than 20 years experience in international development and finance, spanning strategy, operations and partnerships, and with diverse assignments in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Prior to taking on her current role, Masuya served as Deputy Executive Director of the UN Environment Program in Nairobi, Kenya. Between 2018 and 2019, she served as UNEP's Interim Executive Director at the Under Secretary General level, leading the fourth session of the UN Environment Assembly and mobilizing resources to support its mission. Masuya has held several senior leadership roles at the World Bank Group, including that of Special Representative and Head of the World Bank Group Office in the Republic of Korea, Regional Coordinator at the World Bank Institute based in China, and Special Advisor to the World Bank's then Senior Vice President and Chief Economist. She also led strategy and operations for the International Finance Corporation in Africa and Latin America, covering the manufacturing, agribusiness, and services sectors. Masuya is fluent in English, Swahili, and Pare, and conversant in Mandarin. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the Assistant Secretary General, Ms. Joyce Masuya. Thank you very much, uh, Soledad. I am extremely honored to be able to speak to you today. Since its inception, the Hilton Foundation has been at the forefront of humanity's efforts to improve the human condition and to alleviate human suffering. Never has this work been more important. The world today faces a series of interconnected global crises that threaten to unravel decades of progress. As we chart a course through these turbulent times, we would do well to recall the world that Conrad and Baron Hilton envisioned, a world that this foundation, the NRC, and so many in the audience today are working so hard to bring about. In his will, Conrad wrote that the world's people, and I quote, deserve to be loved and encouraged, never to be abandoned, to wander alone in poverty and darkness, end of quote. To wander alone in poverty and darkness. These words give me pause because I have been asked to talk to you today about the climate emergency and forced displacement, about migration, about journeys, about wandering. It is a story we are all familiar with, for the story of our species is a story of migration, of a voyage that has seen us fan out to almost every corner of the earth. And yet, what is happening on our planet today is horrifyingly different from those early beginnings. The stable climate that humankind has enjoyed for around 10,000 years, an era of climactic calm that has birthed civilizations and allowed our species to flourish, is rapidly coming to an end. If emissions accelerate, then one in every three people on Earth may soon live outside the ecological niche where humans have thrived for thousands of years. These changes 
will turbocharge a movement of people unlike any the world has ever seen, redrawing the map of our species. This movement has already begun. Just last week, I visited camps in the displaced, for the displaced in Yemen, where the impacts of the climate crisis on the world's most vulnerable were brought home in grim detail. I met with Azraq, a woman displaced four times in eight years. She lost her husband and brother to war, and now her country is being hammered by the climate crisis, causing water shortages, drought, heat waves, dust storms, and floods. Extreme weather now forces more people from their homes than war. But the slow burning impacts of the crisis are just as bad. The millions in Southeast Asia who have left their homes because they can no longer produce enough food to feed their families. The millions in the Sahel who have streamed towards coasts and cities as drought turns land to dust, forcing them into cities and slums already straining to provide for their people. The children in the Horn of Africa, forced to walk for days to find water as the rains fail and the region tips towards full-blown famine. More intense and more frequent hurricanes are destroying more homes and upending more lives. Floods are washing away schools and futures. Rising seas are slowly swallowing up island nations. As the climate emergency intensifies, the number of people forcibly displaced will rocket. And as it does, millions more will be forced to wander on Earth alone in darkness and poverty. But it doesn't have to be this way. Our fate is not yet written in stone. There is still time to act. First, we must do everything we can to minimize forced migration. The faster and deeper we cut emissions, the more we keep climate change in check, and the fewer people will be forced from their homes. We are heading in the wrong direction. Emissions are set to rise 14% this decade when they need to be cut in half to avoid the worst. Change is possible, but governments must make polluters pay. That means ending harmful fossil fuel subsidies and heavily taxing the windfall profits of energy firms that are making hay while people suffer. This extra finance can then be used to help people adapt to the climate crisis and to offer a lifeline for those who have already lost so much in the fires, floods, and droughts of our changing planet. At COP27 in Egypt next month, there is a real chance for civil society and others to push nations to fulfill their promise to help those most vulnerable to a crisis they did little to cause. Second, we must make sure that the humanitarian community is ready to assist and protect people. Part of this is about better predicting when disaster will strike so we can plan for the day after. The Norwegian Refugee Council, the recipient of today's prestigious award, is a shining example of this. Its work embodies the values laid out by the Hilton Foundation, those of integrity, humility, stewardship, and compassion. Its work on disaster risk reduction has helped countries like South Africa put in place plans that will save countless lives, reduce suffering, preserve people's dignity, 
and reduce the financial cost of humanitarian action. Like OCHA, the NRC understands that for our work to have the biggest impact, we must give local NGOs, local leaders, local business people, and aid agencies a bigger role. They are the ones on the front lines. They understand the local intricacies, the local impacts, and the local solutions. So let us redouble our efforts to grow the next generation of humanitarian agencies, a generation that can lead the world's response to today's interconnected crisis. Lastly, and more broadly, we must do more to ensure that migration caused by climate crisis is not always forced. Migration is often the only option people have in the face of a hotter, climate-disrupted world. Migration is survival. It is adaptation. It is a way out of crisis. Once we understand this, we can work to make sure migration happens safely and orderly, that people are empowered to make decisions about where they live freely and with dignity. We know that most of, these, most of those displaced by the climate crisis will move within their own countries rather than across borders. They will abandon farms in the countryside and start new lives in overcrowded cities. Badly managed, this influx will cause a massive expansion of mega slums, a sprawl that, in a devastating irony, will make people more vulnerable to the very climate disasters they flee. Deteriorating health, rising extremism, and growing poverty. Cities that are less inclusive, less productive, and less sustainable. And so humanitarian and development organizations working hand in hand with the private sector and government must immediately set about preparing the cities of today for the inhabitants of tomorrow. This means finding solutions that are durable, that increase people's resilience to climate change. It means green infrastructure, clean energy, decent jobs, and nature-based solutions that buffer people from heat waves, floods, and wildfires. Schools, health clinics, sewage systems, public transport, affordable housing, retraining people whose lives have been upended so they can find new opportunities. These are promising signs that this is starting, there are promising signs that this is starting to happen. Bangladesh, one of the most vulnerable countries on earth, is teaching people how to adapt, how to grow salt-tolerant rice, how to farm shrimp instead of vegetables. This is adaptation in the usual sense. But the country is also helping people to move before disaster strikes to towns and cities with greater protection where employment and education is available to newcomers. To all those gathered here and online, what we are seeing today is an unprecedented flow of people that threatens to generate hunger, poverty, and danger on a scale the world has never seen before. To avoid this future, we will need to see mobility as a form of resilience, migration as a form of adaptation, and preparation as our salvation. And we will need to summon the very best of our collective humanity by embodying the values of organizations like the Hilton Foundation. For ultimately, how humanely we choose to treat each other will determine whether we can build a resilient, sustainable, global society able to withstand this century of profound upheaval. 
When I met Azraq in the camp in Yemen, she told me, like others I have met, that what she wants is to be given the power to take care of her family, jobs, basic services, and education. This is what the humanitarian and development sector must deliver for her and millions like her who are forced to flee from war, persecution, and the impacts of our hotter world. This is the mission that lies before us. Let us undertake it with a perseverance that honors the right of every single person to a home, to a life of dignity, to a life where they no longer have to wander this earth alone in darkness and poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Secretary General. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Vice Chair of the Hilton Foundation Board of Directors, Mrs. Ms. Linda Hilton. It's Linda's grandfather who founded the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation back in 1944. And her father, Eric Hilton, served as prize juror for many years. You may have seen in your printed agenda that Foundation Board Chair Holly Hilton McAuliffe was originally going to join us, but Unfortunately, she could not be here today. So it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Ms. Linda Hilton. Thank you, Soledad. In 1996, the foundation created the Conrad and Hilton Humanitarian Prize as a tribute to my grandfather's lifetime of international humanitarian efforts. Every year, this award is presented to a nonprofit organization judged to have made exemplary and extraordinary contributions toward alleviating human suffering. It is nicknamed the Nobel for Nonprofits. The prize has, for 27 years now, helped further fuel the success of exceptional nonprofits. And we are immensely proud of our history and work to date in association with tr the Tremendous Laureate organization, many of which are in the room today. <laughs> this year's recipient, the Norwegian uh, Refugee Council, is an organization that the prize jury selected due in part to its long-standing dedication to work with individuals swept, a, uh, swept up in some of the most complex and often most neglected crises our world faces. NRC's work is driven by the needs of displaced people. The organization act actually actively seeks to understand the challenges of the people affected by this displacement, the systems that influence the situation, and what solutions would address their challenges and improve their lives. NRC partners with international, national, and local actors to maximize the collective impact, ensure effective coordination of services, and engage in advocacy efforts. They work with so many people. And you heard today several, uh, the statistic of 100 million people that have now been forced to flee their homes. And in 19, or, or, sorry, I'm in 19. <laughs> in 2021, NRC actually assisted 10 million people globally. And that is huge, it is so significant, and quite a market share of the 100 million. When we learned of the jury selection of the Norwegian Refugee Council as last, or this, this year's prize recipient, I think that I can speak for the entire board of directors that we were thrilled with this decision. So with that, I would like to say to the entire Norwegian Refugee Council team, thank you. Thank you for all the work that you do, and congratulations. <laughs> now I would like to ask that Peter Lahorn and Jan Iglen please join me on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. 
Please stand as we honor the 2022 Hilton Humanitarian Prize recipient. warmest gratitude to, to all of you here for this warm uh, applause. Uh, warm thanks to Holly, Peter, Maggie, everybody from the Hilton Foundation. Many thanks to the Hilton family who hails uh, from a farm uh, 25 minutes uh, right from our headquarters in Oslo. And Thanks to the jury, to Joyce uh, from uh, Ocha for her wonderful speech. Listen, this prize is so important for our 16,000 field colleagues. It's a morale boost. So those of our colleagues who today, very early, went out to reach communities in eastern and southern Ukraine that are under a hail of uh, missiles and that have lost electricity because of the bombing. Those colleagues who are now in the race against the clock in the, and against the winter to provide warmth, clothes, food to communities in the crossfire, they know of the price. They are encouraged. Of 1,400 colleagues, Afghan, female, and male staff that remained on their post in Afghanistan in spite of the adverse nature and in spite of the current authorities. They worked all day today to negotiate for, fem uh, for, for girls' education for reaching new communities to come to areas where we haven't been before. Again, a, a race against the deadly winter in a place where 25% of the economy is gone and people are starving, starving all over. Uh, the, 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 the Western soldiers left, the aid workers stayed behind with the 40 million of the civilian population that were left behind. We today had colleagues in Central America work in, in the barrios of uh, Honduras and Salvador and uh, Guatemala that have taken over by armed uh, gangs. But we have to go there. There are, are great needs there. We're in, in Colombia, uh, going up river in the jungle to Indian communities that have been devastated by conflict, by the drug trade, etc. They need our help. All of our colleagues are delighted with this uh, encouragement because it, it really leaves us the hope that we can do even better for more people in the future. And I'd like, uh, if I may, to, to, to come with three points today. Number one, the need for per perseverance in this very challenging period. Secondly, the opportunities we have to reach more people and the moral obligation we have to reach many more people in their hour of greatest need. And thirdly, the hope that they have that we can realize with them. First, the challenges, really. Uh, to me, it's, it's four C's now. It's conflict, it's climate change, it's the COVID pandemic, and it is cost rises across the board. 
we all know of the, of, of, of the effects of the, of the COVID uh, pandemic. What is not known for many in our global north is that entire uh, communities were devastated in an economic manner because of the secondary effects of the COVID pandemic. Families who were living on $1 a day lost that $1 and they're still struggle, struggling to come back to even the informal economy. And many of them are among the 100 internally displaced and refugees that had no other ways of surviving than some uh, informal trade, some an informal economic activity. Secondly, conflict. I mentioned Ukraine. I in Europe, we're obsessed with this ravaging war in our midst that displaced 14 million people, 14 million people in six months. But of course, it didn't get better in the rest of the world because it got worse in Ukraine and in the neighboring countries. It got worse in the Congo. It got worse in Somalia. It got worse in Myanmar and in Mali. Food, fuel, fertilizers became more costly. Supplies ended and attention dry, dried up. Who's really talking about the horrific famine that is at the door now on the Horn of Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia, and elsewhere. All eyes are on Ukraine. So we need to work for the, for the neglected emergencies, and then in NRC, we each year catalog needs compared to resources per person in need, attention by global media, and diplomatic initiatives to solve crises. And when we compare needs with these international resources, we see that all of the 10 most neglected emergencies were in Africa last year. The Ukraine war also led to a new Cold War that has paralyzed international diplomacy when we needed it the most. Security Council largely paralyzed in, in one place after the other, Syria, Yemen, etc. We need the diplomats to help us. There are political and developmental solutions to humanitarian problems. What we can do is help, support, sustain, societies until there is a negotiated peace, until there is an end to the war. On the climate uh, issues that Joyce so well uh, mentioned, few have understood that in, in spite of the unprecedented displacement of people by conflict, even more people are now displaced by climate change. The natural disasters that were predicted as a consequence of climate change are happening. The drought in Somalia, the floods in Pakistan, the, the, the bushfires in, in California, it's climate change. And those who are first and hardest, hardest hit are those who did nothing to cause climate change. Now, altogether, there are 840 million and counting people now going hungry tonight worldwide. In addition to the 100, soon to be 110 million people displaced by conflict, I have in my 40 years as a humanitarian worker never seen a period with so many people in great need and such a widening gap between needs, assessed needs, and available resources. 
And that is going to be tougher with the final C, the cost crisis. So when everything is 10% more costly and you have the same amount of funding as you had last year, aid workers have to make impossible choices of who to help and whom to not. Now, it's not hopeless, however. So my second point is, in spite of unequal challenge, channel, uh, challenges, we have unequal opportunities. The world collectively had, have never had greater resources at hand that we have never had more advanced technology available to organizations, but most importantly, to the people we are there to serve. We have a young generation entering into international and local aid work that are better educated than any of us was when we started. It is possible to change things for the better with the power of perseverance. Let me uh, mention some of those things that have become better. In all of the natural disasters and conflicts where we are working together, local organizations, international organizations, the UN system, the Red Cross and Red Crescent system, mortality and morbidity is down markedly. More people displaced, more people in need, but more people saved, more lives saved. Education is up. Even emergency education in conflict zones and disaster zones is better. Disease control is better. Water and sanitation services are, are, are much better uh, on a higher quality. The provision of shelter is better in part because we have better needs assessment. In the past, when, uh, when we, we did our work, I started myself driving a second-hand car from uh, Chicago to Panama and going on uh, to Colombia to work as a volunteer at the age of 19 in the local uh, Catholic relief organization. At that time, I didn't even know there was a war in, 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 in Colombia. Uh, there was no international uh, solidarity, uh, really. There was only the local uh, organizations, and they were completely overwhelmed. Today, there is a system. We have several hundred international organizations involved in humanitarian work, and there are thousands of fantastic local groups. Communication with the people we serve has also become much better. When I look uh, to the past, I'm ashamed how often we provided relief that was not necessarily needed. We thought it was needed. Today, more than a third of all of our systems is unconditional cash in the hands of the mother or the father or both. They decide. So our colleagues in, 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 the, in the well done movie by film by, by, by the Hilton Foundation uh, showed how much of our work is now cash. You decide because you know what's needed. Should it be education? Should it be food? Should it be healthcare? Should it be the ability to, to, to uh, move? Or should it be the investment in some livelihood? You decide. Now, the localization that was mentioned in the, in, in the good panel here, and where I agree we are far behind where we should, in the grand bargain that I'm, I'm, I'm leading, there is a lot of self-criticism among donors and international organizations. That, that is 3.5% of the total aid going through local groups. However, now finally, donors, international organizations, realize that it has to be much more of an equal partnership, 
The local organizations were there before we came and they're going to stay when one day we leave. Now, self-critically, I think we have to realize that the progress that there has been in overall effectiveness of the assistance is not yet there when it regards to protection. The abuse that civilians, including the most vulnerable children and women, that protection is not improving at the scale of the, t of, of the technical uh, assistance work. We, we cannot continue to give blankets to people who have been gang raped. We cannot continue to not fight the impunity that is still there uh, for those who are, are, are attacking civilians again and again. Therefore, we're also stepping up our advocacy, speaking out when it's needed and when it is dangerous for the people themselves to tell what is happening to them. We've been punished, uh, four or five countries we have been suspended in, thrown out of, uh, but when we're still going to speak out. The humanitarians cannot, <laughs> humanitarians cannot be, 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 be passive witnesses to horrific abuse that is happening against defenseless people. We have to speak the truth. Now finally, um, we are also becoming better collectively in innovation. And I, 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 I want to mention that here in California, home of innovation. The, we recently had a hackathon uh, among youth in some of the, uh, our refugee camps where we are doing camp coordination. And in the Asrak camp in Jordan, a group of young uh, refugee youth won one of the uh, uh, prizes that was implemented and was basically a system to uh, use the, the, the little electricity that was available in the, in the camp better. Now, they s the saving of electricity uh, uh, through the day left, it, it made it possible for the camp to go from a few hours of electricity per day to um, electricity 24 seven. So light for education, uh, the electricity when it is needed and not just when the camp can afford to put it on. And it wasn't us doing it, it was the youth who invented systems and devices and did campaigns for how to, uh, to economize with their electricity that made that better for the whole camp. We've had now better learning sets, uh, programs for traumatized kids where teachers are able to, to design not only the, the education but also their counseling and their, and their interaction with the children that are traumatized. So from Gaza to now Ukraine, to many other countries, we are rolling out a system that was developed in a cooperation with the teachers, local teachers themselves. And finally, the global digital community hubs that we are developing with uh, Twilio and uh, WhatsApp and other companies here present are at the moment communicating two-way with hundreds of thousands of people online, which makes us possible for us to hear what they need, when they need it, give advice on, on where to go and, and, and how to deal with the crisis situation. But first and foremost, they tell us what's needed and they criticize our programs where it is needed. Now, finally then, we can provide hope. I mean, again, the power of perseverance is that I 
need to work harder to realize the hopes and the dreams of the children that are now in our schools. We have one and a half million uh, children in schools that we sponsor and, 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 and org where, where we organize local teachers to provide education. So when I go to these places, I always ask, children, what, what would you like them to be when you're as old as me, or I mean, not as old as me, it's too old, I mean, when, when you were grown up. And they, and I'm always so taken with how many want to be teachers and nurses and builders and engineers and farmers. In, in Cox's Bazar, as well as in Rakhine, I met with uh, Rohingyas on, on either side, and they said, thank you for the primary education. Please help us the next levels, because I want to be a, t a teacher. I want to be a doctor. In northern Cameroon, uh, I, I came to a place that had been basically torched by Boko Haram, coming from, uh, from northern Nigeria. And I, I, again, I asked the children, what, what do you want to, to be? And you would expect them to say, I, I, I want revenge. Uh, the people torched my ho home. They killed relatives. I want to fight. I, I want to continue this war. No, they all said, we want education, we want to be teachers, engineers, nurses, farmers. We want to rebuild. So that's the challenge. They want to be teachers. We can enable that, but then we need to do more and better in a more innovative way through the power of perseverance, on behalf of all of us in NRC, I thank the, the Hilton Foundation and all of you for this uh, wonderful, wonderful help to do better. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, and congratulations to you and the entire Norwegian Refugee Council team. I now have the pleasure of introducing someone who, in 2015, America, American Photo Magazine named as one of the five most influential photographers of the past 25 years for changing the way we see world conflict. And when we heard Peter speak about the purpose of the foundation as it relates to Conrad's vision, that the peoples of the world deserve to be loved and encouraged, never to be abandoned, to wander alone in poverty and darkness, you cannot help but think of the work of our next speaker, Lindsay Adario. Photojournalist Lindsay Adario covers major conflict zones around the globe, including the Middle East, South Asia, Haiti, and Africa. A Pulitzer Prize winner, she is a regular contributor to National Geographic, the New York Times, and Time Magazine. Most recently, she has covered the coronavirus pandemic, the Syrian refugee crisis, the ISIS advance in Iraq, the civil war in South Sudan, and the flow of African and Middle Eastern migrants into Sicily, in addition to the war in Ukraine. Adario has been the recipient of numerous international awards throughout her career, including a MacArthur Fellowship, or Genius, grant in 2009, the Overseas Press Club's Oliver Rebo Award for her series, Veiled Rebellion, Afghan Women, and the 2009 Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting for her photographs in the New York Times, Talibanistan. In 2010, Adario was named one of 20 women on Oprah Winfrey's power list for her power of bearing witness and one of Glamour Magazine's 20 Women of the Year in 2011. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Lindsay Adario. Hi everyone. I'm gonna stay very far away from this because it's very beautiful and I just flew in from Somalia, so I'm sure I'm gonna knock it over. <laughs> I'll get started right away. 
I'm going to start with some recent work from Ukraine. Um, I first got a call from the New York Times last December, and they asked, if there is a war in Ukraine, would you like to cover it? And I said, sure, not thinking at all that there actually would be a war. So in early February, I got another call saying, get on the next plane. And I left on Valentine's Day and went into Ukraine. And I was there for about 10 days before the war started. I was in the east, uh, in Donbass, when the war started, and quickly made my way back to Kiev. And this is literally, as I was driving into the city, there had been a missile strike that morning. And this is the second day of the war. I've never seen such mobilization in 22 years of covering conflict. This is Julia, she was a teacher. On the first day of the war, she decided she would sign up and leave her life, and she's still there fighting, and now she's in Kharkiv. Uh, most people's lives ended up in basements. Uh, this is in a maternity hospital, and many of these mothers have gone down into the basement. Some of them were also, there was another ward where people were being treated for cancer in an oncology ward, and this is a young mother who had just given birth the day before. As missiles struck day after day in Kiev, this was the reality. People, men, often men who were not able to leave, put their wives and children on trains heading west. Many were heading out of the country. And the scenes were incredibly chaotic and heartbreaking as people jockeyed for any position on a, on a train or anything out of the city. And day after day, we saw people mourning their loved ones. This is outside of a building that had been struck that morning. We were upstairs working, and it takes the rescue crews sometimes hours to find the deceased. In the suburbs around Kiev, in Irpin and Bucha, we've since seen the images of incredible torture and, and sadness that came, out of, and that came out of Bucha and Irpin. And we saw every day there was an exodus of civilians crossing this broken bridge out of Irpin. I waited a few days at first because I wasn't sure if it was safe. There was a lot of artillery in the distance. And finally, on a Saturday, I decided, okay, the next morning I'm going to go. I've seen a lot of journalists covering it. And there were so many civilians, of course the Russians would not strike a bridge where they know that it's a civilian evacuation route. At 7 o'clock the next morning, I went to the Irpin Bridge, and as I arrived, it seemed very tense. Um, there was gunfire in the distance, artillery, and I heard uh, one round come in quite close, about 300 meters off to the side, and I assumed that they were firing at a Ukrainian position. My security advisor said, would you like to leave? And I said, no, everybody knows this is a civilian evacuation route. The Russians won't target it. Well, the next round came in almost immediately after, and it was closer than the first round. And then a third round came, and came in, and it was almost next to us. And I'll show you a video. Что вчера было, детьми кажется. Погано будет. Детей двухсотых увозили, мирное население, маленькие. This is the aftermath of that attack. To me, this was one of the first times that I've actually been in an attack. It was almost 20, 30 feet from me and witnessed the aftermath. Often I come upon a scene and this is what I'll see, but I haven't witnessed what exactly happened. In this moment, I saw the deliberate targeting of civilians and I've covered war long enough to know that, those, that whoever was firing the artillery was bracketing onto that position. 
My second trip to Ukraine, I ended up covering the exodus out of Mariupol. People coming out of Mariupol had been living in basements for sometimes up to six weeks, not ever seeing the sky. I then moved out to Donbas and was on the front line. Uh, this is the Carpathian Sitch, a group of Ukrainian fighters, only about a kilometer away from Russian positions. This is the first time I actually heard small arms fire because most of the war in Ukraine is artillery and it's shot uh, from a distance, so very hard to gauge where the danger is. And this is in Bucha, just in August. They're still burying the dead from Bucha. Tigray is a war that we hear almost nothing about because the Ethiopian government is not allowing journalists in. Uh, right now, there's a complete ban on journalists going to Tigray. And in fact, the only reason I got in last year is because I went to cover the drought in the Horn of Africa for National Geographic and was given was not denied permission to go. So I did my work on the drought and ended up trying my luck at getting into Tigray. And I got in and I spent about six days there. People are terrified and this was a year ago. So this was in May 2021. Very few journalists have been there. There are thousands of people who have been displaced. Uh, civilians are being hit in the crossfire. This is a young girl with her father. And this is a girl who was burned in her home after an artillery strike. This girl was shot, th th this was a young girl who was playing with what she thought were toys and of course it was an unexploded ordinance. And she and two other children were injured. And the malnutrition is rife because food is not getting in. The Ethiopian government is not allowing a lot of the transport of food. There are warehouses that have been stocked that no food can be delivered to the people. And I went to go meet with the head of the hospital in Mekele, which is the capital of Tigray. And he said, please, can you do a story on the rape of women? He said, every day we're seeing women coming in in droves who have been held captive and raped. And I said, sure, if you can help me. And so I went and he, I literally interviewed about a dozen women, one after another, who bravely told their stories. This woman was literally tied to a tree for a week and raped repeatedly, and her son was executed at her feet. So these stories are still happening, but no journalist can get inside. I will now show you a video from Myanmar. This was on assignment for the Annenberg Space for Photography, and it's narrated by Kate Blanchett. Pulitzer Prize-winning photojournalist Lindsay Adario has traveled the world covering the horror of war and its aftermath. This is the first time she's been to Myanmar. She's here to document the plight of the Rohingya Muslims, a minority forced into internal displacement. It's clear that it's very difficult to get access to the Rohingya and to photograph them. This community lives confined to a small strip of land on the western coast. The only semblance of freedom they experience is by the sea. They can't leave, they can't work, they know their boundaries. Like right next to them here on this side. In the hospital, things are much worse. It's almost impossible for anyone to get any sort of medical treatment. They're not allowed outside of the camp, so they just die. It's here that Lindy meets Moriam Katu. When I first met her, she was sort of just leaning against this wall crying because she was so... She was in so much pain, I imagine, and she just couldn't breathe. She basically knows she's dying a slow death and there's no one to help her. 
she decided to go home. Lindsay goes to the village looking for Moriam. People need to understand the plight of refugees and the fact that no one wants to leave their home and no one wants to be a refugee. This is something that is forced upon people. Sophia. Can we come in? Can we come in? Finally, she finds Moriam. Oh. She doesn't, uh, doesn't look good. No. Apparently, ten days after we left, she died. So one of the byproducts of war, of course, is displaced. And I've been photographing refugees around the world uh, since I started covering conflict in 2000. Uh, the Syrian refugee crisis, this is during ISIS in uh, northern Iraq. And this is at the Turkish border, Syrian refugees fleeing. And these are Syrian mothers who were all pregnant. We followed three pregnant Syrian refugees through their pregnancy and the delivery of their children as they tried to make their way to Europe. And so this is Taima, about a week after she delivered her baby, living in a refugee camp in Greece. And then I went on the Mediterranean and did uh, six different tours at sea in the Mediterranean, where I spent two weeks photographing people trying to make their way to Europe mostly sub-Saharan Africans. And I wanted to sort of just personalize the story of refugees a little bit. This is in South Sudan. I've been covering South Sudan since it was part of Sudan. And this is in 2014. Uh, this is a conflict that's been going on for years, essentially since the country was born. And we see malnutrition, fighting. Uh, this is directly outside of a UN base in Bentu. And in 2015, the New York Times Magazine asked me to go to South Sudan to follow three children who had been displaced by war. One was a Syrian in Lebanon, one was Chol in South Sudan, and, th and another was a Ukrainian. And so I went to meet Chol. This is in Nial, which is in the middle of the Sud Swamp. And the only way to get there is to helicopter in, and there's no food and no water. We had to bring in all of our own supplies and sleep in tents. And thousands had been displaced from the ongoing fighting in South Sudan. And Chol was from Lair, which was a place that was very, very heavy fighting. The government forces were fighting against uh, the rebel groups there. And so I met Chol, and he was about 12 years old. And a few months prior, the government soldiers had come into his village and taken his father and his uncle and put them in a thatched hut and set the hut on fire. And Chol was, had jumped into the swamp and was watching this from the swamp. He and his grandmother and one of his eight siblings ended up swimming and making their way through the swamp for months until they got to Nial. And that's where I met him. And this is at that time. And he told me all about his journey and that all he wanted to do was get to Kenya because he had a cousin in Kenya and he could go to school. And so this is at a school uh, in Nial, at, in that little island, while they were trying to make their way to Kenya. So I spent about five days there. And at the end of the five days, I do as I always do, and I gave my phone number to his grandmother. And she spoke very little English. And I said, look, if you make it to Kenya, call me and maybe I'll see you one day. And so, of course, they're not really aware of time zones and time difference, and so my phone would ring at all hours of the night for the next, you know, six months. Oh, Miss Lindsay, we made it to Kenya. Oh, Miss Lindsay, Chol is in school. And so I kept getting calls, and I said, that's really great, you know, that's great. And then about not even a year later, Time Magazine called me, and they said, we have an assignment in Lair, and that was where Chol was from. 
And Chol lived in a village that there was no phone. There was one person in the whole village with a satellite phone. And so Chol didn't know if his mother was alive. He had no idea if any of his eight siblings were alive. And his mother didn't know if Chol was alive because they had no communication and Chol had fled with his grandmother and one sister. Lair, the South Sudanese government, again, was not letting journalists into Lair because there was so much killing that happened there. Nick Kristoff was the first journalist who got in, and very luckily I got in after with Aaron Baker for Time Magazine. And we got in through aid agencies. IRC said, okay, we'll put your name on a manifest, but we can't help you on the ground. ICRC said you could pitch a tent on the ground, but we can't help you anything else. Because everyone was terrified of retaliation from the South Sudanese government for helping journalists expose the story. So we ended up walking through these places. And I went to ICRC and I said, you know, I photographed this boy and I, I wonder if his mother is alive. Is there any way of finding a woman who lives in this village? I had her name and I had the village name. That's all I had. And the guy at ICRC said, yes, if she's alive, there's a food distribution tomorrow and it's the first one in four months and there are 17,000 people coming. So if she's alive, she'll be there because she'll be hungry. And I said, okay, great. I was very skeptical. We woke up at six o'clock in the morning, we went out, and this is what I saw. So there were people from coming from all corners of the horizon to get there, to get food. And I was photographing and photographing, and then suddenly someone from ICRC, the Red Cross, came up to me and said, we found Chol's mother. And I said, I don't believe it. How can that be possible? It's only been two hours and there are 17,000 people here. And they said, we found her. So I started interviewing her and asking her all these questions that I knew the answer to. And suddenly it dawned on me that it may actually be her. And so I had brought a copy of the New York Times Magazine with me, with Chol on the cover. But I didn't have it with me that morning because of course I never believed I would find her. I asked if I can go to her house the next day. There was one car in the entire area, so I had to find the guy with the car, which broke down many times on the way to her house. I got there, and here she was. And she was sitting with all of Chol's siblings. And I said, I think I met your son. And I showed them the magazine, and everyone started crying. And they couldn't believe that th he was alive. And I explained, no, I, I, he's alive, and he's in Kenya, and he's in school. And I said to Chol's mother, well, we can't call because there's no service, but would you like me to record a video of you and I can fly to Kenya and show you, show Chol the video so you can give me any message you want to give him. And so she sat down and she fixed her dress and she said, Chol, don't come home. Stay there and get educated and then you can come back and help us. And so I went and I flew to Kenya as I promised. Chol was in school. He was already learning English. He was staying at Kakuma, the refugee camp there, and I played the video of his mother for him. And he was totally stoic. And he said, as the man of the family, at about 13 years old, he said, I must be educated and I must learn, and then I can go home and help my family. So this was last week. Uh, Jan gave a great introduction to many of these stories, <laughs> actually. Um, I have been covering the drought in the Horn of Africa through National Geographic, the Society, and the magazine. And um, as he said, it is much of the country is reaching not only emergency levels, but catastrophic levels. And there are hundreds of thousands of people who are facing the potential famine. The result is, of course, because so many of, the livestock, of people's livestock have died. They're dying in mass. And scenes like this are extraordinary. This is in Puntland. I actually started in the north to get a sense of what an emergency looked like compared to the catastrophic situation. So this is what leads to famine, because people live off of their animals. And when their animals die, they no longer have food. They no longer have milk to feed their children. And many people have been displaced. Over a million have been displaced within Somalia. And then I went to Baidoa. Baidoa is a small area surrounded by Al-Shabaab. That is where it is likely to be declared a famine if it's declared a famine. And it is a heartbreaking scene, a heart-wrenching scene. This is Naima being held by her grandmother. Naima has a severe um, dermatosis. Most of her skin has fallen off. She had edema so bad. Um, and 
her mother is extremely sick, and so her mother went back to the village. Most people cannot get any medical care outside of Baidoa because much of it is controlled by Al-Shabaab. Another issue is that they can't get vaccinations, and there's a, measles right now is rampant. So combina a combination of malnutrition and measles, or malnutrition and tuberculosis, or malnutrition and pneumonia is killing children. This is Hadija up in the upper right looking at the camera. Hadija walked for a week to get to Baidoa because all of her animals died. Her husband left her. She had four children. I said, I was talking to her and I said, when did you arrive? She said, I just arrived last night. And I said, how long did you walk for? She said, one week. I said, how many children do you have? She said, well, last week I had four. Now I have two. Two died on the way because, and I said, why? She said, I have nothing to feed them. And I said, why did you come? And she said, I'm ho I heard that the aid agencies are here and I can get food and water. And I said, do you know where you'll sleep tonight? She said, no. I went to another camp and some woman, the camp manager, who was a local woman who works in tandem with many of the aid agencies, she came and said, there's a little four-year-old boy who just died in the tent. And I went to go see the mother. Uh, she, I, I asked for her story. I said, when did you arrive? She said, I arrived recently because two of my sons died in the village. They got measles and they were malnourished and they died. And she said, so I came here and now my third son has died. And this, these are scenes that you're seeing every day in Baidoa and in Somalia. And it is important to not repeat what happened in 2011, because I was in Somalia in 2011, when a quarter of a million people died from famine. And so these are the early warning systems. We've heard from Jan that we know that we can do something now. It's not too late. Thank you. Lindsay, that was an amazing presentation. Can we have another round of applause for her fantastic work and her incredible bravery um, and courage? We appreciate that. I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Natalia Kanem, who serves as UN Undersecretary General and Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, the UN Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency. With more than three decades of strategic leadership experience in public health, social justice, and philanthropy, Dr. Kanem is a medical doctor with specializations in epidemiology, preventative medicine, and maternal child health. Her entire career has been devoted to research and advocacy toward improving the lives and livelihoods of women and girls. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Natalia Kanem. Muchísimas gracias, estimada Soledad, mi hermana. Dear Linda Hilton McAuliffe, Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. Excellencies, members of the board. Peter Lawhorn, President and CEO of the Hilton Foundation. Dear Jan Egelon, Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Council and your team. My dear sister, Joyce Msuya, Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Coordinator at the United Nations. Dear poets and artists, dear Lindsay Adario, friends all, I greet you in the name of peace. This is the noble purpose of the United Nations. And it is my fervent hope for that world of peace that will erase, erase such images as we have seen and heard about this afternoon, and that these images may be replaced by 
ones of joy. It's a pleasure for me to be here at this symposium so necessary at this hour for this world, representing the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, UNFPA. And I am really delighted, having had a background in philanthropy myself, that the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation has awarded this very important prize to the exemplary, to the life-saving Norwegian Refugee Council, the power of perseverance. I would like to congratulate the executive director and the entire staff worldwide of the NRC. Bravo, so well deserved, and equally to appreciate the Hilton Foundation on your 27 years of perseverance in uplifting a sector that willingly runs towards the fire, towards the fray. This humanitarian award, with all its prestige, recognizes what our colleagues at UNFPA see each and every day in the 120 countries where we work. The significant leadership and contributions of the Norwegian Refugee Council to global humanitarian response efforts, particularly in the areas of protection for refugees and displaced people, but also that power of imagination and perseverance, as we have heard, to innovate for better circumstances for people in need. And yes, with dismay, we have to note that humanitarian needs are soaring globally. And this work assumes new urgency because prevention is obviously always going to be better than cure. And as we meet, we face the specter of famine in the horn, the, de the horn of Africa, including Somalia, as we've seen, the deadly conflict in Ukraine, and the ripple effects across the globe from deepening crisis in Afghanistan and ongoing conflicts in Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, and too many other places. We also witness the increased destruction caused by climate-related disasters from the unprecedented floods covering one-third of Pakistan to the devastation that has been wrought by Typhoon Nora in the Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand as Hurricane Ian, which battered communities right here in the United States, across the Caribbean, and in Cuba, where I arrived from yesterday. In a world where more people are in need, more humanitarian assistance and pr protection is necessary than ever before, it is fitting that we stop, we pause, and we pay tribute to those who are the brave first responders in this case of the NRC. And UNFPA is very proud indeed to partner with you around the world and work together to provide protection services. As we think about the global protection crisis, I think about the face of a woman, of a girl. Because in conflict and in crisis, community and social protection mechanisms are often immediately damaged and disrupted. And it's women and girls who are vulnerable. And why is this? Vulnerable to a lack of shelter, food insecurity, separation from family, livelihoods that are lost, and an increased self-care burden on herself but also on family members. And yes, we are seeing increased unconscionable sexual assault, rape as a weapon of war, and other forms of gender-based violence being employed. All of these factors compound women's risks of exploitation, of trafficking, and abuse. This year alone, a record 69 million people need services to respond to gender-based violence, primarily women and girls, young people, at times men and boys, and other at-risk groups. 
including members of the LGBTIQ plus community. As UNFPA leads on gender-based violence within the humanitarian sector, we prioritize protection and work to ensure the coordinated assistance to those in need together with critical partners, and NRC certainly is among those. And we've seen an increase in people in need of protection in the majority of the humanitarian context where we work due to the global effects of the war in Ukraine, the rising food insecurity, and the impact of COVID-19. And just weeks after the war in Ukraine began, I met women flowing out of Ukraine into the border at Moldova who had had to flee with whatever they could carry on their backpack with a child in each hand very often, leaving behind their husbands, their brothers, their lives, and in one case, a young child to an uncertain fate. And as I spoke with these women, the harrowing stories that they shared illustrate just how important the human rights fundamentals are for women and girls and for everyone. And the right to health is a human right, the right to be safe, the right to a safe pregnancy and to, lead, and to live free from violence, from rape and abuse, remain at the center of the rights-based humanitarian response. Because as we saw so uh, poignantly depicted in Lindsay's photographs, pregnancy does not stop when conflict arrives or when crisis strikes. Menstrual periods continue. Miscarriages happen. Births choose their own time. And that may be on a train, in a camp, in a basement, in a subway station. And there are so many other areas where people queue for the services that UNFPA renders for sexual and reproductive health services. Now, contraception, sexual and reproductive health care, prevention of gender-based violence. These are not luxuries that I'm speaking about. They are not peacetime luxuries, and I insist that they, may, that they must be a non-negotiable part of every emergency response. And UNFPA works with partners to scale up the delivery of essential services for women and girls in Ukraine, in Moldova, in neighboring countries, and to date, we've delivered more than 120 metric tons of reproductive health supplies to hospitals, to maternity clinics, to communities, trying to help ensure that pregnancy will continue to be safe, as well as trying to ensure the dignity of people who may have lost everything, but it is their right to personhood and bodily autonomy that we defend. And that may mean a hygiene kit with menstrual products, but it must also include the listening ear of a social worker, a midwife, a nurse, someone who cares to ask you what happened on the journey. And as you proceed, it is so important also to understand that you can recover from any trauma if you are helped, if you are not left bereft. As we've deployed more than 100 mobile health clinics across Ukraine to provide such health services and psychosocial support to survivors and to those at, risks, at risk, we've also opened 27 facilities for violence survivors, including shelters, including crisis rooms, including counseling centers and phone hotlines. And in Moldova, we've supported more than 40 safe spaces for refugees. Last week, in partnership with a Ukrainian NGO, we launched a confidential toll-free hotline to provide psychological support for men. Staffed 24-7 by a team of professional psychologists, this new hotline aims to help men prevent aggressive behavior, to give them an opportunity to speak 
and to seek other forms of expressing frustration by helping them to acknowledge, to express, and to address their emotions. And let us not forget that countless other scenes of suffering play out across the globe with a distinctly female face. Imagine hopping onto the back of a truck, desperate to flee fighting in your village, only to be grabbed by combatants, dragged off, and left unconscious and alone in the bush. And this is what happened to a 17-year-old, Mahlet, who uh, we met in Tigray, in that region of Ethiopia. And eventually, she found her way alone to a camp for internally displaced people. She was relieved to be able to talk to a counselor. And only months later, she chose to say that she was seven months pregnant, having hidden this, keeping it secret, out of fear that she would be discriminated against and punished by community leaders. And indeed, few survivors of sexual violence ever speak. They don't speak of their ordeal. They're afraid of the stigma that is so unfair, and again, against their human rights that attaches to them rather than the person who attacked them. And they're all too aware that the issues that Secretary spoke to now of impunity may also mean that justice is going to evade their perpetrators. And that's why this crime of sexual violence is so underreported, because it's unspoken. And it's up to us to make sure that we speak. Last year, I served as the humanitarian sector's overall champion for the protection of people from sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. And this offered me an opportunity to listen to women and girls and to learn from them. In Yemen, for example, I met very young girls who were married off to men more than twice their age because their impoverished families then had one less mouth to feed. And as one of them told me, she ran away because rather than her life getting better, it got worse. And in a UNFPA training workshop, she was able to attend school, to be able to start doing small crafts, and more than anything else, to associate with others of her age and to get that social support. And in places like Congo, in uh, the aftermath of the war there, visiting the Panzi Hospital run by Nobel laureate Dr. Denis Mukwege, we saw the difference that medical attention and psychosocial uh, support can make in the aftermath of such happenings. Women who uh, spoke with me also gave me their recommendations for what they would like to see in terms of improving services. And we were able to do so much together with persons with disabilities for whom we need to pre-plan and anticipate and do better in consultation with them regarding their safety and security. Local-led Women-led organizations are indeed life-saving, and as we've heard, we need to involve them more. And I'm very proud that UNFPA spends 40% of our humanitarian subventions through the hands of such women-led, locally-led organizations. My final word is about data. Data is what allows us to plan, but it also makes the invisible more visible. And for the early warning systems, preparedness, and response efforts, we work with national statistics departments to bolster such data collection, to disaggregate by gender, by location, by age. And this can spell a difference in prevention of gender-based violence and through the power of perseverance. While we know what works, we need to actively listen. We need to actively help women and survivors speak out, give them opportunities to seek justice and support local leadership. The trust of the people we serve is contingent upon the respect that we demonstrate in our words and our deeds, respect for human rights, human dignity, and the inherent and equal worth of each and every human being. And as humanitarians, it is these principles of respect that we must carry in our hearts 
and in our actions everywhere that we go. And above all, in the words of Wilma Mankiller, the first woman to serve as principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, the secret of our success is that we never, ever give up. With the power of perseverance and with partners like the Norwegian Refugee Council, the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation, and all of you here today, I'm confident. I'm confident that we can put a decisive end to the injustices that lead to the movement of people, that lead to the sexual and gender-based violence against women and girls, and that we will achieve and secure a peace and life in larger freedom for all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanam. Thank you, Natalia, for your warmth and your wisdom uh, and for the leadership you've shown both within the United Nations and in the world of philanthropy. Uh, thank you, Soledad, as well, for, uh, for a terrific day. And you bring clarity, warmth, authenticity, and optimism, and we need them all. Uh, it says, on, the, on your agendas that I'm to be giving concluding remarks, as you see it up on the screen. Uh, help me out. This is, because this has been such a full day, but I would say what's on my heart right now is two truths. One is an awful truth. The, the misery, the challenges, the difficulties that 100 million people need to live every day. We've seen that in such detail from so many angles in ways that pierce the heart. The second is a beautiful truth, that there is power, that there is capacity, that there is love between, uh, between these people at different levels, uh, and that there, there's, there's much to build on. I want to encourage you to acknowledge the first, to look it in the eye, to understand it, to let it touch your heart, but not hold your heart captive. But I want you to live in the second truth, that we can do better, we know how to do better, and we know many people who are working on this, and that we will keep pushing. That is the power of perseverance. I think this has been an informative day. It's an inspiring day. There's some daunting in it. Uh, it points us toward good work to do, it reminds us of our responsibilities and reminds us how we and the world can do better. Um, two Conrad Hilton quotes, I, 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 there's an inexhaustible supply, but they are wonderful. One is that nothing important was ever accomplished without enthusiasm and that optimism is an unstoppable force. So keep those in your heart as you're thinking about today. Now, I wanted to say, make a few remarks about perseverance at four levels. And the first level is that, as we've seen very, uh, very clearly from Lindsay's work, at the individual level, the displaced person, the refugee. Uh, and and Warsan's, uh, her poetry this morning brought that home so clearly. Uh, Les, uh, Lindsay's images, uh, the refugee panel, that I had the honor of, of, of speaking with, all made the point that life is difficult in, in a way that um, needs to be well understood for tens of millions of people. Uh, and I think we should keep that uh, in the front of our minds, that our work is always about making life better for these people. Um, our work is, is driven by compassion but should never end with compassion. It should not just be the sentiment that people deserve a better break. And one of the uh, previous laureates, 2016 Laureate Task Force for Global Health, has added an adjective that turns things around in a beautiful way. They speak of consequential compassion. So when your heart is moved, 
to help a, a person in, in a situation like this, think of how that happens. And, and think of where you are in the world and, and how you can make that compassion consequential. And always, I think uh, John Thon's um, referral to, to dignity and agency should always be top on the list as well when we consider the, the situation of individuals. I think we, we heard a good deal about the uh, perseverance at the level of local organizations. And this, I hope uh, that, that you paid close attention today because there's much good work that we all can do. There's tremendous capacity and too often neglected by the system. And I mean the big UN system, but I also mean each of our organizations. As Sanan said, our, 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 uh, our revisions, our reforms start at home. Let's all look at those and let's put our shoulders to change in the whole system. I would salute the NRC and all of its work with local organizations and encourage more. Also to the other organizations that are here. Let's open this up. The Hilton Foundation is committed to busting beyond the 25% that the World Humanitarian Summit uh, named in 2016. And we will work very hard. We're excited to work with Jan as an eminent person in the, um, uh, in, in the global bargain and with others. And we invite you all to join in that. Third, the, the question of perseverance at the system level, this is kind of the hardest one, I think, because it's, it's very easy to say systems don't change. It's very easy to say, uh, you know, the UN humanitarian system was, uh, was created right after World War II. It worked well for that, but we're in a very different world. But I would ask you to think back on what Shamaran told us today, uh, and Scott, about BRAC. Think back, 1971, Bangladesh had just been through a grueling civil war, was one of the poorest countries in the world. Who would have thought at that moment that the largest nonprofit organization in the world would spring out of that civil war? And that it would be so broad and so bold and so inspiring. That's the spirit that we have to take when we're looking at the, at the system now. And I want to remind you of a couple of things that, that Shamaran quoted his father, uh, Abed, as saying. Don't let people talk you out of big and bold ideas. And small is beautiful, but big is necessary. Now we've heard today, big is necessary, but big needs to work right, right? Big needs to be effect efficient, but it also needs to be effective, it needs to be humane, and it needs to build on the skills and, that, that are all around it. And I think that is our collective work on the system. Um, the fourth is the uh, perseverance at the level of each of you. And I would start with what I hope is a large percentage of the 16,000 staffers of the Norwegian Refugee Council who may be listening to this or watching this online. I would extend that to, uh, to the, the staffs of all of your organizations and to you yourselves. This is difficult work. This is daunting work. This is work when you listen to even a, a, an inspiring presentation, you think, wow, all the things we need to tackle, all the things we need to do. I want to encourage you. Your, your work is vastly important. It's long haul work, it doesn't happen overnight, but you are bringing change. And I want to relate this as well to the legacies of two men that we honored today who had led uh, laureate organizations that were very important to us. And those, of course, are Paul Farmer and Sir Fazle Abed, uh, who, who established Partners in Health and BRAC, which are organizations that just are suffused with this idea of the dignity of the individual, of figuring out how to work to support those individuals, of working with people that systems had given up on. Now, we've lost them as people, but we carry their legacies in our hearts. And I would encourage you to take that forward in your work, that same spirit, take whatever sense of loss you have and apply it to the work you are blessed to do every day. And also to know that when your time comes to pass the baton, there will be others who will carry on your legacy as well. Your perseverance matters. So those, those are my thoughts on perseverance. Um, I, I have some other things I need to do, and the first is a real joy. 
It is to thank Maggie and her team for a beautiful event today. I tell you, uh, it's, it's always amazing to watch these things come together, to see what they are becoming, and then to watch them happen on the day of. This is, this is the most energizing day in the life of the, of the Conrad Hilton Foundation. It's always seamless, and it's always, in the, the, the words of the Task Force for Global Health, consequential. You've done a terrific job. Now something a little bit more mundane. Um, we will have, I think momentarily, a band setting up here for an event that you won't want to miss, uh, a, a musical interlude I'll, I'll talk about in just a sec. Uh, but we ask you to use that time efficiently and creatively yourselves as well. There are evaluation forms on your tables. And we uh, pay very close attention to everything. We read each of those evaluations and they really help us guide the next year's uh, um, ceremony. You also can go to your dessert with a lighter conscience, having filled it up. <laughs> All right. Now, um, our final act here today, I think, will be one that you will remember and that will really move your heart. Uh, we have uh, with us the, uh, the brilliant musician and writer, Kanan, uh, whom I know many of you have, uh, have really uh, followed and listened to. Uh, he is a musician, he's an artist, he's a speaker, he's a writer. Uh, he is originally from Somalia and was uh, forced to leave Mogadishu uh, uh, because of the situation in that country uh, and migrated to Canada. He's had major awards, including the VMA and four Juno Awards, which are Canadian Grammys. Uh, and his waving flag became the, one of the 2010 World Cup themes. He has written essays for the New York Times, uh, and I think you will find this uh, a really amazing performance. So I hope I can say, please welcome to the stage, Kanan. being on stage right here. Hi, everyone. How are you? Uh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a shy crowd. Is that what it is? Mm. Well, it's really lovely to be here, to be with you. Um, I've been well introduced, and I appreciate that. My, my name's Kanan. I am Somali. My music is, uh, well, I don't know. Some of you know a bit of my music. And uh, what I try to write about is, is um, uh, the experiences that uh, some of the people who have been here throughout the, the uh, conference uh, talk about in other ways. And um, my way of doing things is to talk through song. Um, so I'll play some music, and I hope that you enjoy it. Cheers. In the beginning, there was a hum from a poet whose pulse fell. Drum, drum, drum. Come, come, come. Suspiciously moved to vicious caution. Dismisses he thinks it's a little often. People get held back by the voice inside them. Yeah. The voice said, I'm poised to speak inside you. Rejoice then and please let me invite you to evil, greed, and lies too. Yeah. Confused the days they moved in ways it soon became a coon and boom, boom, boom. A knock on his door, his heart is no more. A knock on his door, his soul is no more. The poet's got a proposal he would always sow, but never know what it feels to be free. It would be the frozen. 
chosen who poses the chosen all laws oppose him but it would be green that's got him there he's power hungry and proud too hey. people don't care hey. people just care hey. people don't care hey. people just fear it is better to light a candle than to curse the dark In the eyes of the youth there are question marks like freedom Freedom for the mind and soul we don't see them See them for they worth it all that's why we lead them Lead them to these wars and what is it we feed them Feed them our impurities and who are these we treat them Treat them like the enemy humanity will lead them Need them like the blood we spill and we're freedom Feed them for the hearts to fill we mislead them They hunger for the love we give but we cheat them The cops beat them when all he wants is his freedom So they defeat them whatever spirit he's got beat them And they teach him the rest of the world don't, don't need him. him. And he believes it's a disease that he's he eating. Did. Put up our fist when all we want is freedom. Put up our fist when all we want is hate. <laughs> And we keep holding on, and we keep being strong, and we keep going on, and on and on and on. And, on. and we keep holding on, and we keep being strong, and we keep going on, and on and on and on. And we keep holding on, and we keep being strong, and we keep going on, and on and on and on. You are not so shy after all. Here we go. the giving getting me up off the wall I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride I'm just gonna take a minute and let it breeze I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride I'm just gonna take a minute say any man who knows a thing knows he knows not a damn damn thing at all and every time I felt the hurt and I felt the giving getting me up off the wall I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride I'm just gonna take a minute let it breeze I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride I'm just gonna take a minute How did Mandela get the will to surpass the everyday when injustice had him caged and trapped in every way? How did Gandhi ever withstand the hunger strikes and all? Didn't do it to gain money or power if I recall It's the gift I guess I'll pass it on Mother thinks it'll lift the stress of Babylon Mother knows My mother, she suffered blows I know how we survived such violent episodes I was so worried It hurt to see you bleed But as soon as you came out the hospital You gave me sweet shit yeah. They tried to take you from me But you still only gave them some prayers and sympathy Dear mama you help me write this by showing me to give is priceless. And any man who knows a thing knows he knows not a damn, damn thing at all. And every time I felt the hurt and I felt the giving getting me up off the wall. I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride. I'm just gonna take a minute. I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride. I'm just gonna take a minute. All I can say is the worst is over 
now. now We can serve the hard times, divorce It's over now, now. They try to keep us out But their doors is open now, now. my man Getting awards and covers now This is K-9 And still repping the S Coming out of milk this show And still drinking the mess And no matter how we strong, homie it ain't easy coming out of where we from, homie And it's the reason why I can never play phony Tell them the truth is what my dead homies told me Oh yeah, I take inspiration from the most heinous of situations Creating medication out my own tribulations Dear Africa, you helped me write this By showing me to give is priceless And any man who knows a thing knows He knows not a damn, damn thing off the wall I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride I'm just gonna take a minute and let it breathe I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride I'm just gonna take a minute any man who knows a thing knows he knows not a damn damn thing at all every time I felt the hurt and I felt the giving getting me up off the wall I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride. I'm just gonna take a minute, let it breeze. I'm just gonna take a minute and let it ride. I'm just gonna take a minute and let it breathe. Thank you so much. This thing, the award here that's on stage, I have to say, I've been warned so much not to knock it down. <laughs> the team here is very worried about this award <laughs> breaking. And <laughs> as I was, just, I was looking at it and I was thinking, well, if this is about per perseverance, shouldn't you get something <laughs> that doesn't break so easily? <laughs> Okay, the, the, I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna sing something that I I barely do ever, and I barely do this too. Ta I don't take out my phone at dinners or on stage, but this is requires that I do because I don't know the lyrics. It's <laughs> it's very new. Um, so here's to trying something. <laughs> from the deep-eyed people, the long-life people, the cross-legged people, the sunburnt people, chiseled chest people, the moon-crest people, the deep deep manden the treacherous handsome, the see-no-evil, and known-see people, the citadel plunders, infidel hunters, the silk road compass, the past life among us, the praise nevy people, the die petty people, a prejudiced people, a welcoming people, a merciless people, the friendliest of people, the forehead biggest, the faithful sinners, 
the misfortune winners, the casual bigots, the never been niggas, the fallen to lowest, the stained tooth poets, the sky god people, we don't die people, waria waria people, the naysay people, the ray ray people, the heyday people, the late great people, the kuratri people, real free people. Forget everything you've read. I was born and bred among these people. Somalia, I cried today. I saw you falling face down. Thanks. Here's one about a childhood friend of mine. Uh, we grew up together in Mogadishu. So this is this is just the days uh, before the the war began, and we were, you know, she was sort of the bright spirit of the of the neighborhood. There's always one of these kids that just adults and kids, everybody just sort of loves. She was uh, that, and she happened to be my closest friend. But um, so just days after I left Mogadishu, we, we got out just during the conflict and pretty dramatically too. But we, we, we were lucky and we, we got out. But when we got out, three days later, I'm in New York and we get the news that uh, she had been killed. So this, uh, this girl uh, who had that kind of bright spirit, you know, my, my it, was, it was for a long time that I couldn't really think about this. Uh, but there came a moment when I can uh, return to that light of hers rather than the event that intercedes, you know, that darkness that took her. And so I wrote a song for her and about her. Her name is Fatima. <laughs> Picture the morning, taste and devour. We rise early, pace up the hour. Streets is bustling, hustling, they harder. You can't have the sweet with no sour. Spices, herbs, the sweet scent of flower. She came out precisely the hour. Clouds disappear, the sun shows the power. No chance of a probable shower. I fell in love with my neighbor's daughter. I wanted to protect and support her. Never mind, I'm just 12 and a quarter. I had dreams beyond our border is it true when they say all you need is just love is it true what about those who have loved only to find that it's taken away and why do they say that the children have rights to be free what about those who i've known whose memory still lives inside of me fatima what did the young man say before he stole you school we study the lessons i ask god to slow down the seconds he does the opposite that's what i'm guessing i better chill and count my own blessing what is the matter how come you ain't come up the ladder so we can be like there's no tomorrow damn you gonna make me wait till tomorrow she spoke arabic and swahili she'd say upendo unto habibi you so bright you shine like my tv then one day she never came to meet me is it true when they say all you need is just love is it true and what about those who have loved only to find that it's taken away and why do they say that the children have rights to be free and what about those who i've known whose memory still lives inside of me fatima what did the young man say
If beauty was in the eyes of beholder, how come everyone hushed when she walked by? How come girls would look just to scold her? How come the angel wanted to hold her? Fatima, Fatima. I'm in America, I make rhymes and I make them delicate. You would have liked the parks in Connecticut. You would have said I'm working too hard again. Damn you, shooter, damn you, the building. Whose walls hit the blood she was spilling. Damn you, country so good at killing. Damn you, feeling for persevering. Is it true when they say all you need is just love? Is it true? What about those who have loved, only to find that it's taken away? And why do they say that the children have rights to be free? To be free. What about those who I've known, whose memory still lives inside of me? Fatima, what did the gunman say before he took you away on that fateful day? Fatima, Fatima. Kiersey here thinks that because we brought the drum and I haven't used it because we don't have the strap, <laughs> that it would be it would be silly. It would be very lonely if I never use it. So here I'll do something very very little with it. Um, it requires a bit of your participation, like this, but in in this particular tempo. Okay. My legs are very skinny, you know, I'm Somali. So it's very hard to hold these things. Until the lion learns to speak, the tales of hunting will be weak. My poetry hails within the streets. My poetry fails to be discreet. It travels across the earth and seas from Eritrea to the West Indies. It knows no boundaries, no cheese. It's studied in parts of Greece. I was born and raised in a place where the tone of flame would blaze, where the foreigners not embrace, where they warn you, jog and pace, where the loners slow, where they gaze in the corner, slow, where they chase with the twist and turn in a maze with a pistol upon your face. So come with me to my lungs, the depth, and be overrun with passion. See how I come, no cash, I'm free in the slum, the past can we overcome? I'm asking we be the ones to actually be the ones to free our people from guns. Until the lion learns to speak, the tales of hunting will be weak. My poetry hails within the streets. My poetry fails to be discreet. It travels across the earth and seas from Somalia to the west. Indeed, it knows no boundaries. No, it studied in parts of Greece. Hey. Thank you so much. It's been nice to be here with you. This is Noel on guitar. Come to help us out from Toronto. One of my oldest friends who's been... <laughs> I'm not going to say anything that's ridiculous. This is a respect, respectable event here. This is not some club where I'm going to start talking about funny histories of you, you know, like where I, I used to make up a, a, a false story, because just to make the tour interesting, I would make up a false story of how I met him every night, and it would be really embarrassing. The more embarrassing, the better. That was like how we kept the road. To be anyway, but this is, a, he's, he's been on tour with me since he had to say, to, he had to say, I got to get permission from my dad, you know, like that kind of, all, all that time, it's been fun. This is Kiersey from Toronto. <laughs> 
And uh, my name is Kanan, and I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for having us play one more song for you. And once upon a time, I wrote a little song like this. When I get older, I will be stronger. They'll call me freedom, just like a wave of yeah. Born to a throne, stronger than Rome, but violent prone, poor people's own, but it's my home, all I have known. Where I got grown, streets we would roam Out of the darkness, I came the farthest Among the hardest survival Learn from these streets, it can be bleak Accept no defeat, surrender, retreat So we're struggling, fighting to eat And we're wondering, when we'll be free So we patiently wait for that fateful day it's not far away but for now we say when i get older i will be stronger they'll call me freedom just like a waving flag and then it goes back and then it goes back and then it goes back and then it goes when i get older i will be stronger they'll call me freedom just like a waving flag and then it goes back and then it goes back and then it goes back oh. So many wars Settling scores Bringing us promises Leaving us poor I heard them say Love is the way Love is the answer That's what they say But look how they treat us Make us believers We fight their battles Then they deceive us, try to control us they couldn't hold us cause we just move forward like buffalo soldiers so struggling and fighting to eat and we're wondering when we'll be free so we patiently wait for that fateful day it's not far away but for now we say when I get older I will be stronger they'll call me freedom just like a waving flag and then it goes back and then it goes back, and then it goes back, and then it goes when I get older. I will be stronger, they'll call me freedom, just like a waving flag. And then it goes back, and then it goes back, and then it goes back. Everybody will be singing it, yeah. and you and I will be singing it, yeah. and we all will be singing it. Yeah. Oh, 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 when I get older, I will be stronger. They'll call me freedom, just like a waving flag, and then it goes back, and then it goes back, and then it goes back. And then it goes, when I get older, I will be stronger. They'll call me freedom, just like a waving flag. And then it goes back, and then it goes back, and then it goes back, oh. When I get older, when I get older, I will be stronger, just like a waving flag. Just like a waving flag Just like a waving flag 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 Just like a waving flag Thank you very much.